and shoulder which is abutting the shoulder this is the case presentation and uh, this is the case which i am going to present and uh, i would like to say something to the students that these two books a uh, manual on clinical surgery written by s das and hamilton belly every orthopedic surgeon or general surgeon will pass if he has done good hard work on these two books these are very simple not more than 100 pages in each book for orthopedics and he can pass any examination if he has done hard work on these two simple books very interesting books now i am presenting a swelling or a tumor or neoplasm now three words lump sometimes they say lump swelling or tumor or neoplasm a lump is a vague mass of body a vague mass of body tissue swelling is a vague term for a neoplasm anything which is in the body to any cause the cause can be traumatic inflammation like that this is swelling given in and this is also swelling in a recurrent giant cell tumor and tumor is the growth of the new tissue uh, new cells which proliferate independent of the need of the body benign are those which are slow to grow without evidence of mitosis and there is no invasion of the, the uh, orthopedic uh, speciality tissue. examinations are fast be it ms or be it dnb exams yeah, fast growing tumor we have uh, again so like last time we have invasiveness now this thing in the shoulder swelling presented first of all we shall take the in the history the general background name of the patient he was 19 year old male hindu by religion farmer and resident of i can say his chief complaints were pain in the left shoulder and upper arm for the last 4 months he was just saying around the shoulder so upper arm and shoulder together and swelling in the upper shoulder and arm for the last 3 months therefore the first line should be in chronology the longer duration symptoms should be written first and then in, in that order by the candidates and this is the case which is going being presented now history present illness most important is duration which we have discussed it it in for the benign tumor it can be years and for malignant tumor weeks to months which already discussed last time also and always ask when the patient was absolutely all right sometimes there can be confusing for few weeks to few months so one question which is to be asked in the duration is when you were absolutely all right the mode of onset in any swelling is very very important they usually say there had a trauma in inf- orthopedics in infection in bone tumor the history of trivial trauma is very common always ask any pre existing swelling before this swelling that there can be a malignant transformation in pre pre existing existing swelling it is very common in multiple hereditary multiple exostosis other symptoms associated with the lump like pain it is very important pain its nature site time of onset this patient has aching more even during rest and this preceded the swelling in osteosarcoma pain appears before the swelling then swelling appears in uh, otherwise in the majority of the bone so, uh, bone and soft tissue tumor swelling first and then pain appears but in osteosarcoma the pain precedes the swelling in soft tissue sarcoma and other the swelling precedes the pain sudden pain is a sign if if, if, it, if it was a mild pain and then patient had a sudden pain this shows a pathological factor in a tumor and <clears throat> this patient had also a history of sudden pain during in the interim period the progress of the swelling is very very important fast growing swellings like patient initially it was just a lemon size and within a month or two months it has become a cricket ball size so th- that is a fast growing swelling exact site like in this patient patient is saying the shoulder and upper arm is in this patient but more so in the shoulder means more near to the epiphysis and if just below the shoulder that means the swelling is the metaphysical area and this gives a lot of clue because where the swelling exactly started that is very important some tumors are in epiphyseal some tumors are metaphyseal some are diaphyseal in a huge swelling the patient's uh, the starting sites is very very important as in in this case the patient was not really at, at this uh, because this is very large swelling and it is very difficult whether it started from the shoulder or it started in the arm then associated symptom like fever is very very important sometime in evening sarcoma there can be history of fever so in the lymphoma so that is also very this is not high grade fever fever is a symptom of inflammatory swelling 
प्रेजेंस ऑफ अदर लम्ब लाइक हेरिडिटरी मल्टीपल एक्सोसिएट न्यूरो फाइब्रोमोटोसिस सेकेंडरी चेंजेस फंगेशन अल्सरेशन दिस शुड बी आस्ट इंपेयरमेंट ऑफ द डिजिटल फंक्शन शोल्डर फंक्शन एज वेल द फंक्शन ऑफ द डिजिटल पोर्सन ऑफ द लिम्ब रिकरेंस ऑफ द स्वेलिंग no this was not relevant in the in this present case and there was no such history loss of the body weight this patient had very huge amount of loss of body weight and almost 10 kg it told in last two months this is very significant in tuberculosis and in malignant sarcoma particularly osteosarcoma and ewing sarcoma weight loss is very fast whether he has taken yes he, this patient was taking pain killer and antibiotics but there was just mild relief but the progress of the swelling did not stop now the history of the related symptom we have already discussed weight loss breathlessness always ask because if we are suspecting a large tumor the history related to the metastasis should also be uh, uh, taken in mind like weight loss breathlessness cough hemopsis and exhaustion or cachexia past history is very important there was no not, nothing remarkable in this case as far as this case presentation is concerned but patient should have the candidate should have a bit of including every part of the history past history any drug history or treatment history this patient took pay, some painkiller and some other medicines and get from quack or there was no relief but the, this history is very very important because this may be very important from an aesthetic point of view allergy history the medicine like steroid anti hypertensive diuretics hormonal replacement therapy contraceptive these are very very important and always ask this history there should be habit this patient personal history is very important this patient was non smoker non alcoholic vegetarian and unmarried there was nothing <coughs> and always take relevant positive uh, history in all cases family history very important because in hereditary multiple exostosis and neurofibromatosis like this hemophilia tuberculosis diabetes mellitus these can run in family in the present case there was no uh, family history of any swelling or any other disease as far as this case is concerned now i am going to present examination of this huge swelling in the shoulder and arm area now all general physical examination all we uh, candidate should make habit of uh, having general physical examination like build of the patient pallor rectus attitude of the limb this is very important in orthopedics like in this case he was holding the limb in the opposite hand and was tilted towards the swelling because of the weight of the this swelling and probably they, he had pathological fracture also general survey of the chest abdomen and cns is very very important it will take few minutes auscultate the breath sounds and do the percussion because if we are suspecting because a large tumor when the size is more than 5 cm it, it is more than even 15 cm though all we can suspect from the first go that it can be malignant also so never forget about the examination of the lung and and therefore always have uh, examination of breath sounds and every even orthopedic resident should have stethoscope in their pocket and examination of the limb so this is very very important i will discuss slightly in detail local examination this is very important inspection and palpation these are the root key, key examination in orthopedics percussion and old auscultation may be left movements and measurements now inspection on inspection this swelling was very large it was from shoulder to almost over the mid arm and always examine vertically as well as horizontal dimensions the skin color is not altered this is almost of normal color in this the skin color was normal it is a pear shaped or ovoid swelling don't use word circular this is a pear shaped or ovoid swelling it is 10 cm by 20 almost 20 by 20 cm on inspection we cannot say exact length surface is almost smooth with few undulations if we see undulations as is not very well defined it is from shoulder to the mid arm almost there is only one swelling there is no other swelling in the body if there is any bone tumor always particularly in exostosis always palpate the metaphyseal area of the all uh, long bones this is not pulsatile now the area the, there are few points in inspection like peristalsis cuff impulse these are not related to the swelling in the limbs but these are very important and they, the candidate should remember all these points in this sequence also because say that so that they don't forget even if one, one point and these these points i have left because these were not related to this swelling skin over the swelling was tense stressed shiny and there were prominent veins this shows that 
is so that this was rapidly in the hand and distal there was a distal limb edema also which is visible in the distal arm also so the examination of the distal limb is very very important never forget the distal limb its attitude and any abnormality you may compare with the other uh, this uh, opposite limb also now palpation this is the most important part in orthopedics it corroborates the finding of the inspection but add the other findings also for definitive clue to the diagnosis for making a clinical impression or diagnosis always learn to examine and note the findings in the definite order there is a, there are 15 points given in kedas or as das now and candidate should have habit of remembering all those 15 points from 1 to 15 in same sequence so that they don't leave it any point is very very it is written in that book also first is temperature this was this swelling was slightly warm pain this uh, uh, and this should be the first point because this should not be second because after well paid after touching the swelling otherwise also some, uh, uh, little bit temperature may increase so first is temperature this was warm swelling tenderness pain on touching or or pressing the swelling that is tenderness this swelling was slightly tender this was size shape and extent this should be the same sequence this was 21 cm in vertical dimension and 20 cm in horizontal avoid or pier shape extends from the shoulder joint just above the shoulder joint to almost exactly to to the exactly middle arm make a sketch even in your history sheet you can make a photograph and then have the dimensions written in the history sheet that that will give good impression surface palpate the surface with the palmar surface uh, palmar surface of the finger the entire swelling varied surfaces that is bosulated or there were some undulations this means variable that, that shows variable consistency the edge of the swelling was not very well defined and irregular and diffuse or this was unclear consistency variable due to soft tissue at some places it was soft some places it was firm and at some places it was hard even some cystic areas were there in the malignant swelling because of, that, that may be because of necrosis fluctuation the, the, uh, this is uh, this is uh, this examination is for fluid filled or gas filled cavities but it was not there in this case now fluid thrill translucency impulse on cuffing reducibility these are some points which are not related to this examination but you should remember all these points in the same line you can directly go to the even compressibility was also not there in this case pulsatility was was also not present in this case but remember all these points and now the now the next most important was fixity to the underlying structure the swelling arising from the skin and inflate are infiltrated by the malignancy there are two methods roll the skin over the swelling with fingers of the both hands or pinch the uh, swelling between the two fingers of the skin so that will show the fixity of the under overlying skin over the swelling in this case it was no, no uh, so much stress that it was not pinchable at places means it was on the verge of fungation or bursting the skin was so tense that it was it was very difficult to pinch the skin so this is important examination this is the most important relation to the surrounding structure a candidate should have some idea from which structure it is arising and from after arising from a particular structure it has gone to neighboring structure like it can be subcutaneous deep to deep fascia over the muscle within the muscle or deep to the muscle subcutaneous swelling will be more mobile in both direction whether the muscle is made taut or relaxed the tumor arising from the surface of the muscle can be moved in both direction with the relaxed muscle if it is fixed or invaded in the muscle it is not possible to move it in the direction of the fiber but it can but on side it can be moved but, but from side to side it can be moved and become more prominent when muscle is taut if it is in the substance of the muscle it will be fixed and size will be size will be reduced when the muscle is made taut if deep to the muscle small swelling will disappear and one muscle is made taut deeper to the muscle of the bone are absolutely fixed with underlying Uh, if the underlying muscle is really even it is relaxed and cannot be moved in any direction and it moves with the bone and in the instant case it was in continuation with the bone deep to the muscles and no part was palpable apart from the bone the, this means this swelling was probably from the bone then movements and measurements always have movements and measurements the distal limb at in this case it should be measured in the distal limb at the identical normal sites and not near near the swelling because otherwise there is a 
but this is the part of the swelling so movement of the shoulder were restricted and painful elbow wrist and hand movements were normal in this patient local examination is never complete without examination of the draining lymph nodes whether we suspect or not although they say carcinoma they spread to the lymph node and sarcoma to the hematogenous but even in these cases we should have a bit to examination of the regional lymph nodes there are th three sites mainly in the body cervical axillary and inguinal these in orthopedics these should uh, every student should know all these lymph nodes and how to palpate and never forget the examination of neurovascular involvement in any kind of case in orthopedics so in this case we are related to the axillary lymph nodes these are the groups we exam this is also a question is examination anterior pectoral group posterior subscapular lateral or brachial group central and apical the lymph node in this case were enlarged but these were non tender and not matted, uh, matted and these were soft probably these were not reactive and not metastatic because in metastatic they will be hard vascular nerve supply all the three major nerves should be examined in, in the upper limb median ulnar and uh, this the radial and even musculocutaneous feel for the radial and brachial pulse always examine just uh, the joints of the elbow move, uh, wrist and hand always look for the movement because major swelling they can malignant swelling they can in all the nerves also always see the color of the and shine of the nails and color and sex of the screen this to do the swelling also now this was the in this case if i in not cell if i will summarize the history this patient presented with a history of pain which preceded the swelling for last 4 months appearance of swelling 3 months progressively increasing just pain was relieved by uh, analgesics but this the progress of the swelling never stopped and it was in the upper part of the arm involving the shoulder also at, at the time of presentation on inspection the swelling was in the upper arm and in the shoulder area extending up to the mid arm skin was very shiny stressed there were engorged veins and on palpation the uh, border of the swelling was not well defined and it was a very large swelling and there were there was variegated consistency some, at some places soft some places firm and in some places it was toward the harder side so the, keeping in view the, these findings and there was no lymph node uh, there were no significant lymph node although the patient had some paresthesia in the distal limb distal limb was normal and there may be some start of the pressure on the uh, neurological uh, this uh, nerves so keeping in view if sometimes the examiner will say you just summarize your positive findings in the history and examination then you have to uh, summarize this history and you can write down in your sheet also so my clinical diagnosis in this case was a sarcoma in the upper arm involving the shoulder joint in a sorry this is a 19 year old male the possibility first possibility was osteosarcoma points in favor young male in the second decade this was 19 year sorry this was 24 followed by pain followed by swelling we put of fastly and progressively increasing very large swelling with tense shining skin with engorged veins and very very get very consistency in the metaphyseal area of the long bone and this is the most common tumor in the second decade Ewing sarcoma can be the second possibility, equally important. We cannot differentiate clinically osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma. Chondrosarcoma is slightly less, less, less fastly growing and relatively occur in the older patients. Giant cell tumor can also be the possibility, but usually take slightly longer history. But it, it is not that absurd. The shorter history. Of infection is ruled out without, because there is no history of high grade fever and no other constitutional symptom. And the swelling was progressively decreasing because with antibiotic and some anti inflammatory the inflammatory swelling can reduce in size also so now this is the clinical diagnosis immediately after clinical diagnosis so examiner will say suppose your diagnosis is osteosarcoma or a malignant sarcoma of the bone how will you proceed to manage in management the, these are the four things as far as sarcoma is concerned first never jump on to the directly treatment surgery or medicine always investigate the patient this is very very important so many times students don't speak investigation and then they land on the problem so always have always say management include investigation from investigation plus treatment so investigation then i will stage the tumor then i will treat the tumor with counseling and discussion with the medical oncologist as per if, if it is a sarcoma and then follow protocol 
if it is if investigation confirm then we shall go like this for this case first and foremost in whenever there is suspicion of sarcoma these are the investigation which should be on the opd seat plain x ray of the affected part x ray of the chest for metastasis mri of the affected limb ct scan of the thorax whole body scan if pet scan is available then ct scan thorax and whole body scan can come into this and we can ignore the these two but this is costly and it is not available everywhere biochemical investigation osteosarcoma they may ask a question alkaline phosphatase is very high alkaline phosphatase is the osteosarcoma is the second most common cause for highest alkaline phosphatase after pages disease and ldh for ewing sarcoma then i will confirm my diagnosis by, by biopsy after mri so that i can plan my biopsy properly now this was the x ray of this patient first and foremost is the plain x ray in two planes because in one plane pathological fracture may not may be missing and we should see all the dimensions of the tumor always have two planes in this patient it was not uh, uh, feasible to have two planes so this was the sarcoma and what are the findings which we look in x ray always look for the bone joint and soft tissue in bone what will you look whether the lesion is lytic blastic or mixed then type of destruction of the bone geographic motheaten or permeative then is there any periosteal elevation cordament triangle or angles what type of matrix the tumor is forming whether it is bone or cartilage or fibrous so this is the in this this is a particular case it is the tumor in the metaphyseal area going up to the shoulder joint even overhanging around the glenoidic cavity and there is a typical sunburst or sunray appearance there are two beautiful cordament triangle appearing and this is a classical blastic appear, uh, osteosarcoma until unless proved otherwise uh, x ray gives us the best clue for making a diagnosis mri gives us the best extent now the next is always a, although this is not the uh, x ray of this patient this patient did not have metastasis but for students i am just showing these canon ball scanries so plain chest x ray sometimes can show the multiple metastasis but these are too late ct scan picks up the metastasis far far early than x plain x ray these are typical canal ball metastasis these are also called scanries or deposits then mri whole length of the joint from above to below all of the whole of the length of the bone should be in uh, involved in the mri or included in mri just to avoid the skip lesions mri will associate medullary and soft tissue extents proximity to the neurovascular structure and their involvement involvement of the joint pathological factor or skip lesions then like like this this is not like uh, 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 just for uh, teaching this was the case this is the medullary extent this is up to the joint and this is the proximity of the neurovascular bundle then ct scan thorax very important this picks up picks up the metastasis very early it is very important investigation bone scan if ct scan and bone scan to be avoided pet scan is available that can be seen there, there, then there is no need of ct scan thorax and pet uh, this whole body bone scan then biopsy very important for confirmation of diagnosis what is the type of the lesion and what is its grade whether it is low grade or high grade biopsy is very very important it can be open biopsy but now coronal biopsy is in the vogue and this is almost gold standard fnsc practically there is no role in musculoskeletal tumor except if there is a recurrence we can confirm that open biopsy taken properly and uh, we should not make planes and it should be done by the team which will operate the patient coronal biopsy excellent 3 to 5 core should be taken very good core and these can be sent for histopathology and ihc and then after this when the when the biopsy says it is a osteosarcoma then i will stage this osteosarcoma it should be known to the candidates and for staging we need three things histopathological grade whether it is grade low grade or high grade that we that will be by the biopsy compartmental involvement by mri and metastasis status by ct scan thorax or bone scan or pet scan only then we can stage without these investigation we shall not be able to stage the case this is anything stage stage 1 2 and 3 1 is low grade 2 is high grade and 3 is any grade with metastasis this is ajcc uh, grading in this size is also included 8 cm is the cut off and grade 3 is skip if there the lesion is with skip metastasis and stage 4a is pulmonary metastasis and 4b is 
non pulmonary metastasis non pulmonary metastasis when uh, there is when there is uh, all sarcoma of the bone first they go to the lung second they go to the other bones then liver and brain when the when they have skipped the lung and gone to the other tissue prognosis become poor and poor now this is the algorithm for staging a sarcoma in this case this this was the probably uh, most probably was the osteosarcoma in the proximal humerus we have clinical examination painful ill defined swelling and we have made a clinical impression of osteosarcoma then we should do a plain x ray of the proximal humerus with the shoulder and x ray chest may detect the lung nodules then we should order for the mri of the proximal humerus along with the arm then ct scan thorax of the for the lung metastasis or technetium 99 bone scan for osseous metastasis then always confirm the diagnosis by biopsy and it will also tell us the grade and then stage the lesion as per the local extent including the size and grade and metastasis if the mri show the lesion extending into the soft tissue all around the proximal humerus in this case the mri the mri was not available with me it was lost somewhere in this patient the mri showed the lesion extending all around the proximal humerus extending far into the soft tissues with met, with no metastasis on ct scan thorax and no metastasis on bone scan and it was high grade on biopsy so now my diagnosis it is stage 2b lesion and majority of the osteosarcoma they present with stage 2b this means majority of them are high grade and they are into extra compartmental so now our diagnosis is a high grade osteosarcoma stage 2b of proximal humerus involving the shoulder joint in a 19 year old male now treatment now treatment starts this so this is very important in sarcoma discuss the patient uh, treatment with patient and family explain the prognosis make a shared decision with the patient and family explain the side effects of the medicines in the presence of medical oncologist and explain the surgical options now the principle of treatment for sarcoma of the bone and is neo adjuvant or periodic chemotherapy followed by surgery whether it is a limb salvage surgery or amputation followed by adjuvant chemotherapy this one line applies to ebic sarcoma soft sarcoma or high, any high grade sarcoma but in chondro sarcoma chemotherapy has no role as per med uh, orthopedic resident and concern for sometimes they will ask which medicine you will give high dose of methotrexate with folinic acid rescue then this is costlier treatment but now in india doxorubicin cisplatin ifosfamide and etoxide the combination of these four drugs is very effective now they will ask why chemotherapy because chemotherapy shrinks the tumor it make easy to excise after better capsulation and my, and it may kill the micrometastasis it gives some time to think and make the mind of the family because we have started the treatment we are controlling the tumor meanwhile within a month or two phase family will also make the mind whether they want amputation rotation plasty or what kind of treatment limb salvage surgery or prosthetic or arthro dc like that. and the most important is when we have given chemotherapy it its response will be judged by in the resected specimen by histopathologist and that is very very important and sometimes some of the non operable tumor may become operable and we may avoid amputation these are the advantages of pre operative chemotherapy now what is the what are, then they will ask what are the surgery in sarcoma in osteosarcoma the most common involved surgery is wide resection then rotational plasty and amputation after wide resection you can have option of mega prosthetic replacement or arthro dc depending upon your expertise and discussion with the patient then they will definitely ask what are the types of resection by the candidates and these are intralesional marginal wide and radical this these have been discussed already in the last week now after that follow up of these cases they, they will say how will you follow these cases sorry now suture removal after 14 days of surgery then after suture removal send the patient to the medical oncologist for adjuvant chemotherapy and discuss with him about the report of the surgical pathology of the resected specimen in view of the amount of necrosis this is very important if the amount of necrosis is more than 90% the prognosis is good if the amount of necrosis is less the pro this may tumor is more viable prognosis is poor then first fo follow up after that 6 6 weeks then three monthly follow up in the first year followed by six monthly follow up up to five year then yearly even the because yearly follow up if for, for possible maybe life long even because late recurrence and metastasis are reported in sarcomas 
examine the local site and clinical examining uh, by clinical examination by patient and inspection and also have a x-ray of the operated site and x-ray test on the on each visit always have a serum alkaline phosphate level so whether it is coming down with chemotherapy and effective yearly ct scan or pet scan if uh, available or affordable is advisable in sarcoma this is the follow now last time dr manish to told some mnemonics i have made one mnemonic of sarcoma for uh, students m is it is a malignant tumor it is the most common primary malignant mesenchymal tumor of the bone it is matter physical in the location there is a bimodal age group one is second decade most common and then after 40 years or 50 or older patient always suspect metastasis at the time of presentation even sarcoma and osteosarcoma are systemic disorders in histology there will be matrix formation that is osteoid formation directly by the tumor cell that is matrix then medical treatment is neo adjuvant chemotherapy followed by adjuvant chemotherapy methotrexate is the dose in high doses the drug of choice if it, if it is single drug multiple drugs adriamycin or doxorubicin which we say iphosphamide cisplatin and etoxide are effective drugs now mega prosthesis after wide resection is in the vogue now it is very commonly being done and it is very effective also and then always maintain the therapy after operation do not stop the medicines and this is this is just an addition for the students that said epiphysiometaphyseal gct egg cell crackling this is expensile this is eccentric anything stages is latent active and aggressive extent in x ray can be done by compenaki grading grade 1 2 or 3 grade 1 2 within the bone expanding the bone and going into the soft tissue extended decurators in majority of grade 1 and 2 if it is not amenable like in grade 3 then excision and in histology evenly what is proportionate but for making an another e i have made evenly distributed giant cells among the stromal cells so this is another mnemonic for gct so this is just for the students now i just completed this and this is the my, my last slide and now i stop here thank you very much to the doa for giving me the opportunity to speak on this topic thank you sir uh thank you dr kundu that is a really an elaborate presentation i think uh, you have uh, put forth thread bare all that is to be known uh, to present a short case i want to one mention was about uh, as we know metastatic workup so for the student who is appearing in his exam what is the basic dr sagar if i may ask the basic metastatic workup that the examiner will expect a student to know when he is presenting a case of an osteosarcoma uh I, for the basic workup it includes definitely first the local staging as well as the metastatic staging as you already mentioned for metastatic staging we must have the basic is ct thorax and the bone scan or pet scan i mean these are the three things which every student should know ct scan and bone scan or pet scan pet scan if it is available yeah dr kundu just one answer yeah ct yeah. plus bone scan or pet scan because uh, you know that this becomes a point for confusion for a for a yes. appearing for for a student ct scan thorax and bone scan is more than sufficient in my opinion yeah. dr sagar you agree i agree because now many of the students are aware of the pet scan so this question is asked again and again and that is why you're asking the question and i think what dr kundu is referring to that the first option should be the ct thorax and the bone scan and option is pet scan if the these two if the if the facility is available but the student has to say ct thorax and the bone scan as the first option so the, i think uh, i think for i think for examination purpose ct thorax and pet and uh, uh, bone scan bone, bone scan is a uh, better choice than pet scan i believe that uh, becomes the first answer that should come out in case of a uh, metastatic work for osteosarcoma if the student know if the student know that i have to do metastatic work up even that is enough that is enough they that should is. know that osteosarcoma and ehme sarcoma they should know that they metastatic work up, work up has also to be done 
that is more yeah. than sufficient yeah, it I, is kind of thorax and bones carries yeah. enough for them i wish I, i wish all students would get examiners like you sir yeah i i think <laughs> the i think the algorithm of approach which dr kundu explained that uh, examination during examination the focus should be only that the candidate or uh, the student is examining the swelling nothing else yeah. not no, yes. there should not be tumor in the mind yes, so yes. once once he uh, see the x ray or or there is something doubtful in the history then comes to the tumor and uh, algorithm of investigation and approach like uh, investigation with biopsy mri and then biopsy that is enough for uh, for the pg candidate yeah. and one thing for the pg students if they are listening never go jump to the mri directly please always have plain x ray of the affected part in two views at least and x ray chest then you can go to the mri although mri is very important for local extent of the tumor but first and foremost is the plain x ray because on x ray which is more than 120 years old investigation we, we are now expert on the x rays and we can make clue on, on for making a diagnosis x ray is more important and for extent of the tumor mri is very important so never jump so many time i see in opd patient bringing only mri and not x ray and i i think i think differential diagnosis is more important than the uh, definitive diagnosis in exam and whatever yeah. differentials uh, a student is making he should know a, w- at least one or two points in the favor of differential yes. diagnosis or to exclude the differential diagnosis absolutely absolutely so uh, dr uh, kundu as we know this usually is a short case in an exam and yeah yeah but it 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 became lengthy because you gave me 45 minutes <laughs> <laughs> it's all fine so yeah. for again for the students benefit how sh- how do you expect them to frame their diagnosis once they have finished their history and examination without having been shown the mri and the x rays Yes. Uh, yes. Do you expect a diagnosis of uh, suppose it was your case of of proximal humerus swelling? Uh, yes. Could be your diagnosis after history and examination. First of all, I think the students should make habit of making a diagnosis from the chief complaint itself. When a patient, and this when 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 they have already read the theory, when a patient in second decade. presenting to a candidate or student large swelling in the metaphyseal area aggressive from the chief complaint itself pain swelling then he should go for positive points in the history itself particularly inspection and palpation and from these three things his chief complaint positive points in the history positive points in inspection and palpation he can make the diagnosis of and he he, 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 he should not make a diagnosis of osteosarcoma hemi sarcoma if he say an aggressive neoplastic or aggressive tumorous lesion in the bone in the upper in this so and so part of the body in most probably in the metaphyseal area although it is so large it is very difficult to whether it is coming from the joint epiphysis metaphyseal so this is more than sufficient for the candidate to pass if they have made a diagnosis of suspecting if they have said i am suspecting some sarcomatous or locally aggressive uh, uh, neoplasm of the bone in this case they should differentiate whether it is arising from the bone or from the soft tissue in which location it is there if it is fast growing this can be aggressive uh, even aggressive gct or osteosarcoma or hemi sarcoma so this much enough for the student because oncology when they will become specialist um, and only then they will become oncologist because this is a particularly very specialized field even so, so many times general orthopedic surgeon have less knowledge about the bone tumor so we should not expect too much from the candidate if they are saying that i am suspecting some aggressively looking uh, neoplasm of the bone or soft tissue in this area more than sufficient this this should not be failed then they can work up according to the investigations they should not forget x ray they should never forget biopsy in a sarcoma without biopsy they can never confirm the diagnosis so so these are the important points thanks dr sadda you wanted to say something yeah dr aksha i i actually just to over emphasize because during my own post graduation you know the moment you see a patient you would say 
वो ऑस्टियो सार्कोमा का पेशेंट पड़ा है राइट इट्स अ माइंड सेट नेमिंग द ट्यूमर एंड आई थिंक द वर्ड की वर्ड विच डॉक्टर कुंडू हैज एम्फोसाइज इट हैज टू बी एन एग्रेसिव ट्यूमर इट हैज टू बी एन एग्रेसिव सॉरी आई थिंक द फोन इज yeah so uh, uh, the, the the student has to remember the keyword that he is talking about an aggressive tumor which rather than naming the tumor which uh, dr brijesh mentioned about the differential diagnosis when the examiner asks i mean he has to lead his viva by telling the examiner i am suspecting aggressive tumor and now the examiner asks okay which aggressive tumors are you thinking of then it should go on uh, he can lead his own viva yeah so uh, if you are correct with the uh, with the fact that it's an aggressive neoplastic lesion and you mentioned the site correctly uh, i guess that uh, comes out as a uh, end to your history and examination for a short case and that is probably what will lead the uh, discussion towards uh, further investigations and things there is also some mention about uh, pain and swelling preceding or uh, uh, otherwise uh what do you think uh, usually pain preceding swelling dr kundu you were mentioning yeah in majority of the bone and soft tissue sarcoma swelling appears first it is not mandatory but in this patient pain was preceding the swelling and it is mentioned in clinical method also in osteo sarcoma they say first symptom is the pain and then swelling because when it is starting in the intramedullary area even then the pain has started and the swelling may be delayed by few weeks to few months two weeks not months sorry in sarcoma so pain can be in malignant tumor of the, of the bone particularly osteo sarcoma and even sarcoma so pain can be the first symptom followed by swelling otherwise in soft tissue sarcoma and chondro sarcoma because they when the progress is fast then pain is maybe the first symptom otherwise in chondro sarcoma and soft tissue sarcoma swelling appears first and when it becomes painful that that, that gives a tell tale sign of sarcomatous lesion so that was the em- emphasis of course so pain preceding swelling is a very important sign which uh, i think we not be missed i think we have uh, we've had an excellent uh, discussion dr kundu and uh, probably we can just uh, now carry on to the next part of today's webinar Thank you so much for being with us. I know. You have thank to... you very much. Thank you very much. I, can I leave now? Yeah. Yeah. Please, please. Sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, sir. Thanks, doctor. Bye. Thank you, doctor Zilla Singh. Thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So uh, the next uh, uh, lecture or uh, talk is on uh, X-rays for bone tumors, and uh, I'll be doing that. This again is uh, is. Uh, keeping in mind the requirements of an exam going post graduate student this talk does not claim to be including everything that you need to know but just the basics is my screen visible now yes 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 yeah so uh, we'll be basically touching upon what uh, the basics of uh, x rays for bone tumors that again an examiner uh, thinks a student should know if a student probably uh, mentions uh, the diagnosis as a benign tumor in an obviously malignant looking lesion or otherwise then uh, of course there is trouble so and uh, this uh, equally applies to uh, our clinical practice where uh, orthopedic surgeon who has a general orthopedic practice does never never wants to miss out on a malignancy because he may want to refer it sooner rather than later and uh, before i go ahead there were a very uh, interesting discussion in the last webinar by both dr manish pruthi and dr lalit mani as to what to look for in an x ray and also dr kundu mentioned in in, in his uh, case presentation uh, the points of what the lesion is going to uh, is doing to the bone and what the bone is doing to the lesion are both very important when we are uh, looking at an x ray with the suspected bony tumor and this is a very commonly uh, used analogy and we again are using it here we consider two armies which are uh, standing against each other and on the other side is the bone itself uh, we need to see what the bone tumor is doing to the uh, what the tumor is doing to the bone and on the other hand what the bone is letting the tumor do to it if the two armies are just standing against each other and there is a wall in the middle the blue one we see something like this 
uh, it's the tumor which is well separated well demarcated from normal bone as you start walking from the tumor to the bone uh, you know where normal bone stops and tumor starts not just that if you have a good wall that is separating the two armies they are hardly uh, bothering each other and they just cannot do anything to each other uh, this is what happens in a latent benign lesion like this one the the lesion that we can be seen here in the metaphyseal area of the uh, femur is actually a non ossifying fibroma and we can see that there is a there is a uh, well defined sclerotic margin let us go on to the next scenario where the armies are still uh, poised against each other ready to fight but there is still uh, they are still very disciplined and still standing in line the wall between the two is now not there so they have started uh, feeling a little jittery and ready to fight the army on the bone side is going is ready to defend and that is what happens when it's a lesion where uh, it's again not very uh, aggressive but not latent either so that's a benign active lesion we can see there are uh, there are sclerotic margins areas but at some areas the margins are not the sclerotic but the lesion is still well defined what happens when uh, some sort of a scuffle starts happening between the two armies you can see some red uh, soldiers on the right side and some blue ones on the left side but still uh, you can make out which side is blue and which side is red so this is what happens when a lesion is benign and aggressive like the one that you can see in the proximal tibia in the x ray shown here so this is a lesion showing a giant cell tumor we can see that uh, the lesion has still uh, at least you can say there is a margin but then the margin is ill defined you can see that this is normal bone and this is where tumor starts but the margin is kind of ill defined at places so this is what uh, happens when it's a benign aggressive tumor now what happens when the two armies practically run over each other there's a mass destruction and then you uh, you can have cities wiped out in uh, in uh, major wars and that is what happen uh, happens when a tumor is uh, is malignant as seen on the x ray here you can hardly make out where the tumor is you can you can see there is something grossly wrong in the proximal femur on the right side but you don't know where uh, where the situation has started where it has intensified and where it stops so as you go from normal bone to the abnormal part you can see probably something started happening here but then uh, you are not sure and then this is where you actually see the the most damage being done so that is what uh, a malignant bone tumor looks like and if you remember this uh, this comparison well you will not falter whenever you look at an x ray and you have you just have to know whether it's benign or malignant what do you do for an x ray you always as as the teaching goes uh, a suspected bony tumor or a bony lesion needs two standard views Uh, a single view may not give adequate information because of the overlap and the and, and the other view might show you whether the tumor is within the bone or outside or paraosteal or periosteal uh, similarly whole bone and joint nearest to the lesion should be included so if it's the proximal femur you should the x ray should include both the upper end that is the hip joint and the lower end that's the knee joint now how to make a diagnosis with an x ray you can have two situations one is that you have seen enough x rays which uh, you you do not expect to have done if you are a post graduate student you have seen uh, enough of such x rays and you hold the x ray in your hand and say oh this is an osteosarcoma or this is an aneurysmal bone cyst but as a student and as anyone who uh, who uh, encounters a bone tumor x ray only once in a while we usually want to follow the second method and that is you can solve the puzzle the good news is that you can put the jigsaw together and uh, arrive at a diagnosis in more than 90% of cases what do you look for when you are looking at an x ray uh, of a suspected bone tumor you look at how it appears what is the location of the uh, lesion what the matrix is like and some other clues that we'll be covering in the talk that follows 
so precisely what we look for is number one pattern of bone destruction uh, the adjacent, adjacent bony cortex or the periosteal reaction the tumor matrix the location of lesion within the bone whether it's longitudinally uh, located in the epiphysis metaphysis or diaphysis and similarly transversely whether it is central eccentric or cortical and then of course the site where the tumor is actually these five things coupled with the age of the patient will give you a diagnosis in a vast majority of bone tumors just with an x ray so coming to the first point the pattern of bone destruction and this of course is a very uh, a, a favorite uh, with all examiners as well as students this there it's there in your textbooks and also in uh, the literature uh, very easy to follow if you just follow a certain uh, pattern that to to study uh, how it has it has been put uh, if you go too deep it be it becomes confusing so the pattern of bone destruction has been divided into geographic moth eaten in permeative a geographic uh, a geographic uh, lesion is where a destructive lesion with a sharply defined border it implies a less aggressive more slow growing benign process and it has a narrow zone of transition so when you look at a lesion and if you can clearly see uh, where the lesion is most likely it is a geographic lesion uh again it is of three types as we have already seen it 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 can have a well defined margin which is sclerotic which means the bone has had time to contain the lesion and form a sclerotic margin around the tumor a typical example is in non ossifying fibroma a well defined lesion but the sclero the margin is not that sclerotic is where the tumor is a little aggressive this can happen with giant cell tumors can happen with chondroblastomas and again it they can be a geographic lesion with an ill defined margin which is quite commonly seen with giant cell tumors so uh, we look at a geographic with a well defined sclerotic margin this is a non ossifying fibroma again a geographic lesion with a non sclerotic margin this is a chondroblastoma uh, another lesion which is a geographic with well defined but non sclerotic margin this is giant cell tumor again a geographic with an ill defined margin so the margin is ill defined this was a metastasis again a geographic lesion we can see the lesion well we can locate it well on a bone but again the margins are not well defined so this is a geographic with an ill defined margin this was an aneurysmal bone cyst again a geographic lesion can be seen in the glenoid and the adjoining scapula uh, again with an ill defined margin this was osteomyelitis now we can again see a geographic lesion because the proximal femur is all vanished but it's quite aggressive and ill defined margins this again was a giant cell tumor let us come to moth eaten lesions so moth eaten as the name shows is like uh, when a moth has has eaten wood or a termite has eaten into wood and it shows areas of destruction with ragged borders there are multiple scattered holes and the holes will be varying sizes and uh, they will be coalescing with each other to form larger and smaller areas it most commonly implies a malignancy and a typical example is a uh, ewing sarcoma or a lymphoma we can see myeloma is also very typical uh, example of uh, moth eaten appearance we can see holes which are large and small and then coalescing together and then again uh, the uh, zone of transition is usually wide another patient with myeloma we can see very beautifully the moth eaten appearance with larger and smaller worm holes the third and the more most aggressive is the permeative lesion where uh, there are again multiple worm holes uh, the axis of these holes are parallel to the long axis of the bone and spreads through marrow space having a wide zone of transition and it implies an aggressive malignancy these worm holes are very small they do not coalesce and again uh, it can be seen in most malignancies of uh, of bone we can see this is how a typical permeative pattern of bone destruction looks another patient with a lymphoma with uh, with permeative uh, destruction so now we can see the patterns of bone destruction from geographic to moth eaten to permeative from less malignant or benign to more malignant 
let us come to periosteal reaction so we all know that periosteum gets thickened and it starts to do something have some reaction whenever it gets irritated whether it be from injury from infection or from tumors so what it does is that it gets thickened gets cellular uh, and it regains its ability to form bone it uh, it this the periosteal reaction reflects the nature the intensity and the aggressiveness and of course the duration of the underlying pathology again we'll go from benign to a more aggressive periosteal reaction a benign tumor will usually have no periosteal reaction at all especially if it's a latent uh, benign lesion or if at all it will be a solid periosteal reaction this is where the periosteum has had time the lesion is not that malignant and the periosteum has had time to form a solid bone which leads to a solid periosteal reaction a more aggressive or malignant form would be a laminated or onion peel a sunburst or a codman's triangle again coming back to our original case we can see it's a benign lesion and there is absolutely no periosteal reaction a solid periosteal reaction in this case an osteomyelitis will suggest again a slow growing or a benign lesion when it becomes more aggressive it becomes laminated or onion peel we can see it's not just one but more than one uh, periosteal uh, reactions here which again shows that the tumor has been elevating the periosteum sequentially before the periosteum gets time to form bone it gets lifted further so that is what happens when a lesion is a little more aggressive and causes a laminated or onion peel a type of periosteal reaction again one more example of an onion peel typically seen in ewing sarcoma but mind you not all ewing sarcomas will have onion peel and not all onion peels will be ewing sarcomas uh, another classical uh, periosteal reaction which examiners will always be very fond of and you should uh, look for an x-ray in an osteosarcoma it was also there in the x-ray shown by dr kundu is a sunburst reaction where you have a, a quick elevation of periosteum and the blood vessels that cross the subperiosteal space uh, are laced with the osteoid this is typical of an osteosarcoma a codman triangle is is the triangle that it formed at the end of the elevated periosteum again shows an aggressive type of periosteal reaction so now we know from no periosteal reaction or solid periosteal reaction to sunburst onion peel or codman triangle is what it uh, it shows in uh, from benign or less malignant to more malignant lesions uh, once you know that it is uh, benign or malignant you would want to know what it actually is a typical types of uh, tumor matrix that you can see is an osteoid a chondroid or a fibrous or most commonly no matrix at all and this is what will show you uh, uh, the the probable diagnosis of a tumor after uh, you have decided that it's malign or malignant a osteoid tumor is when you look at something which looks like cotton wool or a cloud like that is a classical osteoid it may not always be that clear but when you look carefully you you look uh, for osteoid deposition it may be overlapping with the bone but in the medullary canal area you may be able to uh, uh, see it better or better still in the soft tissue component of the tumor if you see there is osteoid and there is a soft tissue component it usually turns out to be an osteosarcoma so look at this this is an x ray that i received just today and we can see Uh, uh the osteoid that is uh, that is uh, beautifully laid by the uh, tumor and clinches the diagnosis of an osteosarcoma again on the right side we can see there is osteoid deposition in the soft tissue component of the tumor again an osteosarcoma what is a chondroid matrix chondroid is when there is cartilage being deposited by the tumor and uh, it typically is mineralized against against uh, so so it is different from the ossification that happens in osteoid uh, matrix it is just a mineral deposit or calcification and it usually comes in the form of either commas or punctate or annular or even popcorn like and typically is seen in all kinds of uh, cartilaginous tumors this is a typical uh, chondrosarcoma 
and we can see the typical popcorn calcification and the same patient's x-ray uh, also is showing that uh, chondroid matrix uh, a lot of times when you have a purely lytic lesion and you suspect a chondrosarcoma you might want to go for a ct scan where the uh, annular or popcorn type of calcification will be better seen as compared to an x-ray a uh, typical uh, matrix of a fibrous dysplasia that you can see in the uh, almost the whole of tibia is the ground glass and that clinches the diagnosis of a fibrous dysplasia but mind you uh, a lot of lesions will have no matrix at all and for that matter even osteosarcomas can have no matrix chondrosarcomas can be devoid of any matrix and it has to be uh, as i said uh, putting together of a jigsaw puzzle rather than uh, just one uh, thing that you keep looking for an x ray will have uh, multiple facets and you have to put together all of them to come to the diagnosis you might not have the typical periosteal reaction but you may have the typical matrix and vice versa so keep looking for all these and then put together and come to a diagnosis uh, another very important thing that you look for is the longitudinal orientation of the tumor whether it is epiphyseal diaphyseal or metaphyseal the three typical purely epiphyseal tumors are chondroblastomas giant cell tumors and clear cell chondrosarcomas the typical giant cell uh, the typical uh, diaphyseal tumors that you should be aware of are the ewing sarcoma and myeloma uh, and of course periosteal osteosarcoma in the malignancies and in benign fibrous dysplasia is a typical diaphyseal tumor uh, most others will actually be metaphyseal this is a very classical uh, diagram that is there for everyone to see and i think every student should be uh, familiar with this whenever you are looking at an x-ray similarly a uh, location the transverse orientation of the tumor is also an important uh, aspect when you look for uh, in uh, in, a, in an x-ray showing a bone tumor a central lesion is uh, a, a classical example is a unicameral bone cyst where the lesion is typically central it causes no cortical expansion and remains within the midline of the bone an eccentric tumor typically is a giant cell tumor again which always almost always is uh, is eccentric if in the ap view it is looking central uh, the lateral view is act will actually show you that it's eccentric similarly osteosarcomas are also quite commonly eccentric the typical cortical lesions which you go further uh, towards the cortex a typical co cortical lesion in osteoid osteoma and a juxtacortical uh, lesion where it is periosteal or periosteal uh, is this depends on whether it is over the periosteum or between the periosteum on the bone and that is where it it shows whether it is a periosteal osteosarcoma or a periosteal osteosarcoma so these are juxtacortical lesions so transverse orientation also gives you a, a lot of idea as to what you are looking at some characteristic locations uh, also come in very handy proximal humerus is a very favorite location of a simple bone cyst a chondroblastoma of course affects the epiphysis giant cell tumor in epiphysis adamantinoma in the tibia and the mandible a chordoma usually affects the sacrum or the clivus similarly osteoblastomas usually will affect the posterior elements of the spine now uh, we we have this uh, temptation of only looking at the bone when we look at an x ray but uh, mind you x ray gives you a lot of information also about the soft tissue a tumor which is showing a soft tissue extension usually is malignant and that is something we should not miss a benign conditions uh, which with soft tissue extension could be like osteomyelitis and sometimes giant cell tumors so when we look at a benign versus malignant uh, we look at in a malignant lesion an interrupted periosteal reaction rather than solid a morthitan or permeative bone destruction there is a soft tissue mass and there is a wide zone of transition uh, i i hope everyone has got the point of uh, how to see whether the zone of transition is wide or narrow when you walk from normal bone to abnormal bone the 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 zone of transition in millimeters tells you whether it is narrow or wide similarly in a benign lesion uh you look for a uh, benign lesion when you're looking at a benign lesion it will be having a well defined border it may or may not be sclerotic there will not be any soft tissue mass there will be a solid periosteal reaction or sometimes no periosteal reaction and the lesion will be a geographic bony destruction 
let us look at these two very similar looking x rays we can see that the age they are both skeletally mature and mind you always look try to look at the age if it's written on the x ray uh, very good otherwise you could at least say whether it's skeletally mature and immature and that will usually give a lot of information as to the probable diagnosis if the x ray shows you the age of 15 versus 50 a lot of things get sorted when you are coming at your differential so the age here both are adults the site both are metaphyseal is there a periosteal reaction on the right side yes there is a lamellar periosteal reaction on the left side there is actually no periosteal reaction okay so something is getting different between the two now is there a cortical breach or thickening yes there is some cortical breach here but on the left side there is no cortical breach uh it is uh, present on the left not on the right matrix of course on both sides is chondroid we can see the typical chondroid matrix with popcorn or rings and arcs the size of the lesion here it is probably uh, maybe 5 cm here it is quite large you actually don't know where it is going to stop uh, up into the diaphysis and that is why the x ray of the whole bone is so important the so size is large on the right side left on the uh, small on the left side and the diagnosis becomes chondrosarcoma on the right side and enchondrum on the left side and this is how you can actually quite mathematically deduce the diagnosis from your x rays again one more uh, the site is of course the diaphysis of a femur diaphysis but is there a periosteal reaction yes there is a speculated or sunburst kind of periosteal reaction we can see it here is there a cortical breach or thickening of course there is cortical destruction is there a matrix probably no we cannot see any matrix uh, in the tumor or if it is there at all uh, it's not apparent on this x ray how is the zone of transition it's of course wide because we don't know there is obliteration or of the medullary canal and we don't know where all the tumor starts and normal bone stops so diagnosis is of course a malignant diaphyseal tumor most commonly it could be ewing sarcoma or it could even be osteosarcoma another x ray which shows age again a skeletally mature patient the site is metaphyseal distal femur and in the lateral view we can see it's actually juxta cortical and not involving the whole of the bone the transverse orientation is juxta cortical matrix is typically an osteoid matrix and the diagnosis becomes a parosteal osteosarcoma similarly another x ray age is skeletally mature site is proximal tibia Uh, again it is not just epiphyseal but also eccentric uh, there is practically no periosteal reaction there is slight or no cortical expansion the type of lesion is geographic with ill defined margins and there is no soft tissue mass so diagnosis becomes a giant cell tumor similarly another x ray showing an adult patient the site is proximal femur there is cortical breach type of lesion is uh, permeative matrix is chondroid a uh, soft tissue mass is present and the diagnosis becomes a chondrosarcoma another x ray distal femur in a in an adolescent we can see it's a 16 years male uh the site is distal femur metaphyseal cortical breach yes it is present type of lesion again is is ill defined uh matrix is there it's actually an osteoid matrix and we can see in the lateral view there is a biggish soft tissue mass uh so there is a soft tissue mass both on the lateral and the posterior aspects and there is a periosteal reaction we can see here there is a cordman's triangle and the diagnosis becomes an osteosarcoma so when will i worry i will worry when the lesion looks disproportionately large especially with duration of symptoms so uh, usually large lesions will be malignancies and we should not forget this very uh, this very uh, basic and simple rule large lesions usually will be malignant when there is an interrupted periosteal reaction which could either be a cordman's triangle or a, a speculated uh, sunburst uh, type of periosteal reaction or even a lamellated periosteal reaction the destruction is permeative or moth eaten rather than uh, geographic the zone of transition is wide and there is a presence of a soft tissue mass or a component these are the situations where i'll think i am probably looking at a malignancy but before i end i'll always uh, want to say this that tumors don't read books 
please always keep a very high index of suspicion tumors will always uh, cheat you they may not follow but when you are appearing for an exam uh you you go by the book and then keep your differentials uh, very carefully and go for further investigations thank you and uh, i'll be happy to take any questions yeah thank you dr akshay for such a nice uh, presentation i'll first go to dr sagar for any questions for dr akshay or any comments so for his presentation yeah sure uh, akshay i mean that was a beautiful presentation and you really tried to summarize uh, the whole vast topic in it Uh, when from the student perspective point of, you know, from the students point of view what i notice is that the students make first the common mistakes that is it a ossification or is it a calcification they always see a, some white shadow on the and they see some matrix and they don't know whether it's ossification or calcification uh, as you rightly pointed out when you're talking about a, 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 of a calcification it is more of a rings arcs and uh, flocculent which the students should know the pattern and when it is very well defined ivory cloud like density that is more of an ossification than calcification and as you rightly pointed out the cordman the sun rays i, I think once the students have seen it they will never forget it even once and that is relatively easy to identify the other difficulty from a, a student from students point of view is that they uh, they fail to identify the moth eaten or the permeated patterns they know the geographical patterns very well they are easily identified by any common orthopedic surgeon as well but the permeative and the uh, moth eaten uh, uh, can be looked into it uh, more carefully as you rightly pointed out that how the small holes in myeloma or it may be a totally fuzzy outline in the uh, so these are the common um, uh, Um, uh, problems which the students make while reading the x-ray apart from they have to make a sequence what one two three four five sequence i have to read from the x-ray which you've already mentioned thank you dr sagar uh, dr brajesh anything you want to add dr manish you are muted yeah dr brajesh are you with us Achal, then we go to Dr. Sharad. Dr. Sharad, your comments or any question for uh, Dr. Akshay? Uh, excellent presentation, uh, Dr. Tiwari. My one question is regarding uh, cortical expansion, which you just mentioned, uh, as regard to periosteal reaction or cortical breach. Uh, what exactly happens in a cortical uh, uh, expansion? What we are talking? What with exact the patho pathology of that? And in which tumors were particularly look for a cortical expansion? yeah a uh, good question dr sharad uh, cortical expansion usually happens with a slower growing tumor as against a malignancy uh, when the tumor has uh, is is not very aggressive the the uh, the host bone or the bone that harbors the tumor has had time for the cortex to keep expanding and try and as if it is trying to contain the tumor so there'll be some expansion without any breach whereas if you want to uh, differentiate it from a periosteal reaction you will actually see that the cortex is has been there uh, all the time and the periosteum has only been elevated with the very aggressive tumor that breaches the cortex doesn't give it time to expand or to contain the lesion and uh, that is where you can say that this is a periosteal reaction and not a cortical expansion cortical expansion typically is seen in uh, in kampanachi grade 2 uh, tumor uh, great kampanachi grade 3 giant cell tumors and that is a typical example where you still do not have any periosteal reaction but you still can have a, a cortical expansion uh, dr brijesh nandan is here dr brijesh any questions or comments for dr akshay dr manish yeah. can i ask just one more uh, one yeah, yeah yeah you can you can sir are we correct in saying that once periosteal reaction has occurred it means the cortical has already uh, breached am i right yes yes absolutely because the tumor cannot affect the periosteum until is it has breached the cortex in some way it may not always be visible on the x ray but yes uh, there is no way periosteal reaction can happen without that unless unless it's a cortical lesion unless it's a cortical or a juxtacortical lesion which affects the periosteum uh, from without so that is a uh, area where but usually if it starts with has to breach the cortex and then it can cause any 
periosteal reaction yeah yeah such a very nice presentation and uh, the one message for uh, uh, interpretation interpretation is the one of the most fascinating part of clinical diagnosis of bone tumors but again an examination uh, you should have a method a proper method to explain the x ray first thing second thing don't jump to the diagnosis again you should keep a differential diagnosis on x rays uh, like uh, sub typical pathologies like uh, osteoid osteoma simple bone cyst with fallen fragment sign others other features are suggestive not the diagnostic first like if you see the chondroid matrix it can be a inchondroma well differentiated chondrosarcoma chondrosarcoma or sometimes a intramedullary infarct also so you you should have a, a, a proper uh, interpretation of x ray without jumping to the diagnosis and the best thing is to uh, interpret the x ray like uh, site uh, skeletally mature immature epicenter of the lesion type of matrix in in these lines and for these things you need to you need to read the x ray at least some x rays so that you can explain the in exam uh, properly uh, yeah uh, dr harmesh yes sir. comments or uh, i'll rather or... like to ask a question from dr akshay sir how yeah, to sure. differentiate abc which uh, is a gct and on a radiology on a, on a x ray what are the differentiating features so the first thing uh, will be that uh, abc's are more commonly metaphyseal gct's are more commonly epiphyseal um, they are both eccentric the age group of gct is slightly higher as compared to abc and uh, believe me you can sometimes have a situation where uh, you uh, just cannot say on an x ray which one of the two it could be and that is where an mri comes in handy and one of the few situations where mri will uh, help you in uh, coming to a diagnosis uh, can i can i add to it uh, yeah yeah sure sir uh, I, i i think uh, dr akshay if you would agree uh, uh, a kind of a solid buttress reaction is usually more seen in the abc than in gct but yes uh, when you have uh, there can be variations but if you see a classical uh, solid buttress reaction i think that is uh, more in favor of not that it is convincing more in favor of abc than gct yeah absolutely uh, dr uh, professor lalit mani your comments or question for dr akshay i think akshay has done an excellent job a very very elaborate uh, lecture uh, making us understand uh, imaging conventional imaging Uh, i would like to reemphasize that uh, orthopedic oncology is a tough area that is where uh, we insist upon clinico radiological histopathological correlation and at that uh, at the end even at times after all these also there is a confusion about the diagnosis so the last statement was uh, excellent that the tumors don't uh, read bones one thing if uh, i can ask uh, akshay again uh, this is a query which comes up and a question asked in exam lesions at times are there in both areas metaphyseal and diaphyseal so do we call them diaphyseal metaphyseal or metaphyseal diaphyseal <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, you could call them either what you want you would usually want to do is put a finger on the epicenter of the tumor and uh, where that center lies is where you would want to emphasize uh, of course we know that uh, gct is actually start in metaphyses and invade the epiphyses but uh, they are the only ones which involve uh, usually the epiphyseal areas in skeletally mature so we call them epiphyseal tumors so i think you should look at the epicenter and uh, use that as your reference point i'm um, dr uh, vinith arora are you around dr vinith okay so uh, dr akshay i hand over to you uh, we can go to the next speaker yeah thank you dr manish and we have amongst us uh, the privilege of having a radiologist who is not just a radiologist but a musculoskeletal radiologist dr gyanish agarwal who is uh, part of the uh, the musculoskeletal oncology disease management group at max hospital saket 
he'll be speaking on the use of mri for bone tumors and as we were discussing in the last uh, webinar uh, mri uh, say when they have to or uh, ask for when they have when they are asked to uh, stage the tumor locally and gives a lot of information not just for uh, uh, management or treatment planning or surgical planning but also sometimes even diagnosis dr gyanish agarwal uh, please start with the presentation sir yeah thank you dr akshay i would like to, to thank the dua also for having me here um, just a second Yeah, is it visible? Yes, it is. Please go ahead. And am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah, thank you again once again, Dr. Akshay and DOA for having me here. Uh, I'll be taking uh, briefly through what uh, MRI can help in the bone tumor and its management. Uh, to start with, the usual confusions is about that what all uh, can be done on MR and the sequences which can be confusing to. anybody to including a new radiologist also but as far as bone tumors are concerned we are uh, uh, need to go through with these four basic sequences uh, to elaborate and assess the bone tumor one is stir t1 and t2 weighted which are two basic sequences and a post contrast t1 fs when we say fs that is a fat saturated means the machine has already taken away the entire signal of any fat which is there uh we'll go with each one of them uh, individually to be more aware how they look uh, individually so when we say stir this is one of the most common sequence uh, and loved by radiologist and uh, the orthopedic clinician also because uh, they give uh, the tumor appears strikingly uh, out of the entire anatomy so these are those sequences where the entire image is looks more like a black or some kind of a dark gray with few striking the white area so this is what a stir image would look like uh, where the tumor would stand out as a strikingly bright area or a white area amongst the entire red dark and black areas so this is what a stir image may look like it is very sensitive to localize and identify a lesion however we can still miss some uh, lesion if we are only depending on a evaluation of stir image especially a metastatic sclerotic deposits from a ca prostate the standard garden or the most important other sequence is the t1 weighted images it is predominantly a combination of white and gray with few black areas here and there the classical thing is that the water or the fluid signal would be black or dark uh, on these sequences and the fat would strikingly appear bright white on these kind of images these are very sensitive to identify any alteration in the marrow signal because predominantly after a certain age of 10 or 12 the fat deposition within the marrow starts and because it is sensitive to fat so the marrow appears to start to appear white within the bone and so any alteration happening within the marrow the marrow will lose its white signal and it can be easily seen on t1 weighted images it is also the sequence where as a radiologist we tend to identify and take it its value in terms of localizing the anatomy and especially the neurovascular bundle locations are very well identified on t1 weighted images this also helps in characterizing the tumor as you can see there are two tumors in the slide here on the right side it's uh, kind of appear the bone being appearing black the iliac bone entirely which is just about some kind of a sclerotic change uh, the rest of a lot of large soft tissue component along with it whereas on the right side is again a pelvic tumor which have some bright areas within this area of abnormality so uh, by this we would be able to differentiate because the chondroid tumors can have a slightly brighter or whiter signal on a t1 weighted images compared to a osseous lesion which are typically dark on t1 weighted images 
uh, T1 sequences are also very sensitive for any discontinuity in the cortex because the cortex is seen as a black line because of a lot of calcium deposits uh, or because of the calcium component in it. So you can see a direct step happening in this proximal end of humerus region. Uh, it's otherwise a simple bone cyst with pathological fracture in it with a fallen fragment can be seen nicely in this sequence. Again, another image where you can see the margin of acetabulum, but the breach is happening along its anterior and inner aspect because of a uh, chondrosarcoma. Uh, T1 weighted sequences are again where a radiologist relies on to evaluate a neurovascular bundle. The neurovascular bundles are seen as these kind of a dots predominantly on an axial sequence, which is cut section and can be very well seen with the fat around it. Out here, it's a large mass lesion replacing the entire sacrum. It's kind of a chordoma where you can see the sciatic nerve being taken off from the right side, but on the left side, the sciatic nerve is not well visualized, suggesting of encasement. Uh, the other standard sequence which is being done in most of the investigations is the T2 weighted images. It is kind of a mix of everything where the image would appear bright somewhere because of the fat in it. The fluid would also appear bright and the tumor which shows mixed signal because of uh, its nature of the lesion. It is a good lesion to decipher the extent. Here what we can see is that the area or the bone is appearing totally dark even on T2 weighted images which corresponding to be the sclerotic changes and the calcium areas or the sunburst or the speculated periosteal reaction is also seen as a dark area on t 2 weighted images. It's a case of an osteosarcoma involving the pelvic bone, the right iliac bone. Now coming one of the another sequence which is commonly used in uh, MRI and we we'll try to rely a lot on it is a post contrast T1 weighted sequences where the fat has been saturated out that means the fat will no longer appear as a white area so that we can see the extent and the areas which are enhancing because the enhancement itself would appear white on post gadolinium images. Uh, it helps us to exact the, give the exact extent of the tumor or the margin of the tumor whereby we can differentiate from the reactive marrow edema versus the tumor extent because the reactive edema may not show any enhancement whereas the tumor will. We'll get a more clear when I show some images later on that. It also gives about the idea about the vascularity of the lesion per se, whether it is a highly vascular or not. The surgeons may need to know that before they get into for the surgery and obviously differentiate the solid and cystic areas within a tumor. Uh, so on the right side, uh, you can see that there is a lesion which is replacing a part of iliac and acetabulum appearing bright. This is a stir image, the strikingly otherwise gray with tumor appearing bright. Uh, T1 post contrast can slightly be confused with the stir images because they can appear predominantly dark because the entire fat has gone dark on T1 post contrast images. But out here what we can see is that the tumor is showing a rim kind of an enhancement with patchy inter enhancement. So as a radiologist I would say that it is mild to moderately vascular. But the striking thing is that this edema which we are seeing next to the tumor on uh, the iliac, superior part of the iliac also shows enhancement stating that it is part of the tumor matrix rather than just a reactive edema. Again, in terms of vascularity, we see a lesion involving the left estabulum and the adjoining ischium, which shows intense enhancement of the post contrast images. So it is a highly vascular lesion. It was an ABC involving the acetabulum and the ischium on the left side. Again, uh, it helps us to differentiate from solid versus cystic. Uh, I was just the same case which I shown you where the cortex break is there, fallen fragment sign, and a classical simple bone cyst which shows a rim enhancement with no other enhancement in the rest of the central part of the tumor. The peripheral patchy enhancement is because of the fracture and then it shows by the edema within the muscles. So the tumor per se is cystic variety with less of any solid component in it going very well with the simple bone cyst. Now, what all MR is helpful? So MR can help in tumor characterization, whether there is a fat, is there a blood or a calcification within the lesion. The main role of MR is to give the local extent. So extent within the bone, whether there is a tumor versus reactive myrodema, as I've just stated, any associated soft tissue or a periosteal component associated with the lesion, it can be very sensitive to it. Extend the tumor again within the bone, whether it is involving the physical plate, especially if the tumor in a skeletally immature person 
and the extent and the involvement of joint, whether it is there or not, these all points become very important when the person is subject for a surgery. Uh, the neurovascular bundle involvement becomes important because if the surgeon is going in, they need to have their margins clear. They would never like it to leave a tumor component behind. Uh, the other component whereby it has been emphasized previously also that you need to cover the entire length of the bone. If it's a femur, we tend to do it as two-stage imaging, but we never leave a bone component in between so as to be sure that there are no skip lesions. And if we are, the intent is curative, then we are not leaving anything behind. Some features, as uh, told by Dr. Akshay, in terms of differentiating between benign versus malignant, the MR would show the similar appearances, uh, so it can also be used to differentiate benign versus malignant. And obviously, in a post-treatment, uh, with the presence of new adjuvant therapies, whether the tumor has responded, regressed, the necrotic component within tumor, and especially once the surgery has been done, whether there is any recurrence or not, in spite of being the artifacts of implant, it can still be very useful. So MR plays a central role now, to in a significant role now in terms of management of the tumors, either the pre-treatment or a post-treatment scenarios. Uh, we'll go through a few situations here. Uh, right now, we are seeing entirely distorted humerus, hardly make out any cortex, uh, whether it is the anterior or the posterior cortex, there is significant remodeling which has happened. Uh, the idea is here to re uh, tell you that the entire extent of the tube uh, that involved bone needs to be covered on an MRI from the, like here, from the proximal to the elbow joint region, the entire humerus has been covered. It gives the entire extent with the specified bony landmarks that how far the tumor is reaching so that the surgeon has an idea that what area and what uh, extent is need to be resected. In this case, there is a breach of physal plate and the tumor is involving the epiphysis, which is seen as a bright area on this stir images and the dark areas on the T1 weighted images, which shows announcement on post-contrast sequences uh, confirming that this is a tumor component involving the proximal epiphysis of the humerus. Similarly, the contrast sequences also helps the differentiating from the solid areas versus this uh, well-defined cystic area in between. It was an osteosarcoma and the case was post-treatment, so it becomes so heterogeneous where an osseous components are there, the entire anatomy uh, uh, has been distorted. Again, the physal plate involvement can be very subtle sometimes, but MR plays a very significant role. Uh, the best part is that the body always have a normal component to compare with, which help us radiology to evaluate. Out here, there is a lesion involving the lower metaphysal region of the left femur, uh, with a, where uh, a sclerotic component appearing dark on stir and T1 weighted images encroaching up to the physal plate. The bright hyperintense signal gets obliterated here, suggesting that there is a physal plate involvement. So the margins have to be assessed accordingly. The, uh, at least a centimeter or 1.5 centimeters away from it. So it's going to involve the growth plate on this side, whereby an oblique sections can be done from the left side on the middle aspect of the femur. Again, in another case, this was an osteosarcoma on the right side. On the left side, it's a case where we can see there is altered marrow signal lesion involving the proximal uh, left femur. There is, an, again, an area of abnormality involving the epiphysis, which shows post contrast enhancement. So there is a breach of the physis and the epiphysal involvement is there by the tumor, uh, which again becomes an important in terms of extent of the lesion. And this was uh, post-treatment, even sarcoma, where the extent of the tumor was reassessed. Now coming to the soft tissue component and a periosteal component. Sometimes it becomes that they both are same. Uh, but if you ask me, as a radiologist, we tend to feel that the both are slightly different from one another. This is one of a good example as far as radiology is concerned, whereby you can see that the right acetabulum appears slightly altered, expanded, or showing an altered signal. And a rim kind of a thing is happening all around it, which is more kind of a radiating kind of a signal, which is the sunburst periosteal reaction. But then when the margin of the periosteum is ending, you can see another large soft tissue on the gluteal side of it, which is a soft tissue component of the tumor. So in this, the acetabulum is involved, showing a sunburst kind of a periosteal reaction and a large soft tissue component, which is invading the muscle, which is very well confirmed on a post-contrast images. So this was an osteosarcoma involving the 
flat bone here. Uh, the osteosarcomas tend to be more uh, append appendicular skeletal involvement, but they can tend to involve flat bones also, whereby they can have a mix of uh, chondro osteosarcoma kind of a component. Uh, the joint involvement becomes very important uh, because, again, in terms of a surgical planning, whether joint is involved or not, out here it's again the same uh, chondrosarcoma lesion which I showed previously, showing the brighter areas of T1-bitted images. Out here the cortex, which is very well seen on the joint side of the estrobulum, is not well seen on the T1-bitted images. And we can see a soft tissue component, especially on a stir images, which is entering into the left hip joint, suggesting of the involvement of the joint. Again, here on the left side, it's a large mass lesion uh, having a speculated kind of an involvement. Again, a chondrosarcoma apparently involving a flat bone, again on the right side. But out here, we sometimes may or may not be sure whether the SI joint is involved or not. This is a stir image. We give a contrast and we see that there is a definite enhancement happening within the joint region, suggestive that there is a tumor component involving the joint. However, the sacrum appears to be preserved out here, but the joint is involved. Compared to the other side, there is hardly any enhancement happening, which is sometimes a reactive synovium. It's beyond the reactive synovium. It's pretty nodular here and suggestive of a joint involvement. Neurovascular bundles becomes pretty important in terms of margin and whether they are involved or not. It helps in prognosticating whether if we go for a resection, if we take out a major nerve, whether the patient is going to have a uh, neurological deficit because of the surgery. Uh, out here, it's the same example which I've shown previously that the static nerve on the right side is very well seen, but the nerve roots on the left side are not seen and are encased within the tumor. This is a sacral chordoma. Skip lesions in the same bone becomes important. Again, with the curative intent, we see a lesion involving uh, on the left side of femur, but because of the entire coverage of pelvis, we see a multiple lesion involving the right ileum, the proximal femur, uh, it's the case of a metastatic carcinoma. Again, another uh, lesion involving the humerus. There are multiple dot-like areas and a large area involving the diaphysis, nearly the entire diaphysis of the humerus, showing the multiple skip lesions, again, in a metastatic setting. Treatment response. Uh, with the available and use of new adjuvant therapies for evings and osteosarcoma, these days the role of MR becomes important to assess whether the tu tu what kind of response is there on the treatment. Uh, so this is a case of an Ewing sarcoma where there is a larger soft tissue component, some cortical irregularity and a marrow involvement which shows significant response or post chemotherapy with a larger uh, resorption of the soft tissue component which is now looking more like a periosteal reaction. This smaller soft tissue component is no longer seen and the marrow signal abnormality area has also reduced over the duration. So it shows a good treatment response on these MR images. Now, benign versus malignant is more of an X-ray thing, uh, but again, the features or the state markings remain uh, more or less same as far as the radiology goes between X-ray and uh, MRI. Benign lesions would show no or minimal or solid periosteal reaction. They would tend to localize within the bone with minimal soft tissue component. And uh, special sequences, what we may have on MRI is a diffusion weighted where the benign lesions may not show a restriction wherever the malignant lesions may show restriction. The tumor margins and perilational edema on MR may not be a good criteria to differentiate benign versus malignant because uh, it can very well overlap between the two kind of lesions. I mean, the benign lesions can show a large perilational edema wherever a malignant lesion may not show. So we don't rely much on them. Uh, it's pretty different from a radio X-ray radiology. Uh, as we go through a few of the cases, uh, I will be highlighting this point again. Uh, to start with, osseous lesions, uh, we tend to, they appear dark on both sequences, as far as all sequences. Out here, we see a nodal lesions predominantly involving the cortex of the head and neck region of the talus having expansion both towards the joint side and towards the medullary cavity. There is a large edema all around it, joint effusion. But again, we it may look very aggressive on MR. It may look very malignant kind of a thing on MR, but uh, we really need to see ourselves uh, as a radiologist that what kind of things are happening. We can see a remodeling happening along the anterior margin of the tibia which itself says that the lesion is being there for some duration to cause these kind of remodeling in the tibia. And this was an osteoblastoma 
osteoblastoma scan shows a large edema surrounding the lesion uh, because it is eroding the joint surface of the tibia the reactive joint effusion was there uh, osteosarcoma it has been talked about a lot uh, by dr kundu sir and by dr akshit tiwari also uh, just to highlight that besides the appendicular region uh, we, they tend to come quite frequently somehow with us in terms of flat bones uh, it's again uh, showing a large lesion having a speculated kind of a sunray sunburst kind of a uh, periosteal reaction having uh, component both towards the internal and luxus outer side of the iliac bone the bone appears entirely dark on t1 beta images which shows a heterogeneous post contrast enhancement uh, out here the neurovascular bundle is nicely displaced but the fat between the neurovascular bundle and the joint is preserved suggesting they are just displaced rather than being involved uh again this is just to give an idea how the diffusion weighted image may look like uh, it appear entirely bright the osteosarcoma so it's it's very fuzzy and grainy kind of an images most of the times uh, the diffusion weighted images you really need to have an eye to look through what is happening on it out here it is showing a night restricted diffusion the entire lesion uh, whereby it is showing a restricted diffusion out here it is again a uh, stir weighted images but we can see a large chunk of soft tissue component and uh, entering into the joint cavity suggesting that the joint is being involved in this case uh para or periosteal osteosarcoma uh, there is a recent case where we see a large uh, speculated or sunburst kind of a periosteal reaction with the background of an osteoid matrix in spite of having two views we are not sure whether the underlying medullary cavity is being involved or not or what is the extent the cortex is appear apparently pretty preserved out here with no expansion of the underlying joint uh, underlying bone out here so initially we thought it to be in the garden variety of osteosarcoma but then the few things which were going against were how the radiological appearance was there uh, to our surprise when we did an mr the larger chunk of the tumor was located within the periosteum with minimal uh, marrow edema or the patchy areas within the marrow of underlying bone the cortex appears to be very well preserved and intact except for some speculated areas there was a thought of a differential of an ewing sarcoma but again the medullary changes were very limited so it eventually turned out to be a paraosteal osteosarcoma with a larger soft tissue component and a minimal medullary cavity changes coming to the chondroid lesions uh, the chondrosarcomas they tend to be bright on stir images with internal uh, patchy areas appearing dark because of the chondroid matrix they are slightly brighter on t1 weighted images because of the chondroid matrix uh, much more appreciable out here and on post contrast images they are especially very less vascular uh, as compared to the other lesions they may show minimal irregular nodular rim enhancement uh, as seen in this case so as in this case whereby the matrix is otherwise appearing bright on t1 weighted images they are appearing more like a lytic lesion but having an aggressive kind of a margin suggestive of a chondrosarcoma uh exostosis which shows a prominent cartilage cap is a very striking lesion on mri because the emphasis or the requirement of mri is predominantly to look and assess the cartilage cap to uh, evaluate whether there is a secondary chondrosarcoma is happening or not so this nightly bright appearing cartilage cap on stir images can be very well seen on mri we can give an exact dimension so any thickness going beyond 1 cm where we can raise a suspicion of underlying uh, malignant transformation or any invasion into the surrounding structure uh, can also raise a possibility that the exostosis being a long standing is going into a malignant transformation chondroblastoma these are quaint looking lesions predominantly epimetaphyseal in their location they can sometimes have an internal septation uh, they typically show peripheral rim enhancement uh, they are slightly complex compared to a simple bones cysts which are hardly having any epiphyseal component they are predominantly metaphyseal in their location yeah you can see there is hardly any edema in the surrounding marrow suggesting that these are predominantly uh, non aggressive lesions and they are not extending to the cortical margins compared to a gct uh, i've just put a gct next to it because uh, compared to a chondroblastoma gct tend to appear to be very aggressive because of the marrow edema surrounding the lesion they tend to reach uh, all in the 
coronal images they are reaching up to the cortex margin uh, the epiphys uh, so the uh, articular margin so as here uh, so they are predominantly again in upper metaphyseal region so this is how i was saying trying trying to emphasize that the perilational edema can be very variable compared to a malignant or a benign lesion so we don't usually rely on it it just only suggests that the surrounding tissue is showing a reaction because of the uh, active nature of the lesion rather than being a malignant or benign they are much more heterogeneous compared to chondroblastoma whereby it helps us to differentiate between the two giving sarcoma uh, i've uh, just took this images from uh, radiopedia as liberty there's they are large uh, dark vessel and uh, ranging up to the metaphyseal region they predominantly have a large soft tissue component with a florid periosteal reaction out here the importance is that uh, in spite of the proximal extent the soft tissue component can sometimes creeps along the periosteum and it is crossing the physeal plate and reaching up to the joint which becomes important again in terms of treatment and surgical planning uh in terms of tumor characterization fat is something which can easily be characterized by mri out here we can see as lytic lesion with internal sclerosis and all with the calcaneum the lytic area corresponds to bright signal on t1 vitted images when we run t1 fat saturated where the entire signal from the fat goes away we can see that the bright signal is been lost confirming that and it corresponds to the rest of the subcutaneous fat in easy way to uh, imagine that how the fat may look on a certain signal certain sequences uh, confirming that there is a fat component within the lesion helping us to make a diagnosis of intraocular lipoma uh coming to fluid fluid level where the mr is very sensitive especially with the background and to differentiate between an abc and gct as it was raised previously uh, mr can be very helpful to decipher these fluid fluid lesions in an expansile eccentric bony lesion located in the proximal metaphyseal region of the left femur showing some internal separations some endosteal scalloping here of the cortex and on fluid forming a multiple fluid fluid level within suggestive to be an uh, anisomal bone cells there is hardly any soft tissue component along with because fluid fluid levels can be seen not only in anisomal bone cells but also in telling the tin osteosarcoma it happened twice with uh, me and dr akshay that initially a lesion was labeled as abc but eventually because of its progression they turned out to be telling the cardiac osteosarcoma uh, fluid fluid signal can also be seen in uh, osteoblastoma a giant cell tumor fibrous dysplasia and sometimes within a simple bones especially post fracture now out here just to emphasize it's a giant cell tumor because of its location and region in the subcortical region but showing an internal fluid fluid level it can sometimes because be very difficult because all uh, just based on its an artificial component rather than just entirely metaphysical component uh, a possibility of uh, abc within a gct was suggested here uh, telangiectetic osteosarcoma has in a larger soft tissue component and in the fluid fluid level involving a, a kind of an aggressive looking periosteal reaction and osteoid matrix on an x ray help us to differentiate it from an abc uh it's an abc involving the spine multiple fluid levels are seen within it so you have to really visualize that how the fluid levels may appear they may appearing vertical but because at the time of scanning patient would lying supine so that collaborates to the position of the patient at the time of scanning so they are more in the dependent part uh the caution which i was talking about that we avoid characterizing a bone tumor only on mri just to emphasize i have just put in one example here we done an mri the lesion looks to be very well defined some internal separations no aggressiveness in surrounding uh, um, the marrow surrounding the lesion appears to be black so no edema hardly any soft tissue component maybe a cortical breach involving on the a uh, lateral aspect uh, tumor otherwise very well contained within the bone no expansion some periosteal reaction plus minus limited or peripheral and heterogeneous enhancement involving on post contrast images but when we went back to the x rays it was uh, an aggressively looking lesion the margins are ill defined on an x ray there was a breach of cortex which was very well seen uh, within the x ray and when we go and observe carefully we can see a laminated periosteal reaction suggestive of it to be an aggressive lesion and this later turned out to be an osteosarcoma so uh, you should not entirely rely on mri to characterize a lesion x ray has to be correlated very well the so we should not follow 
or fall to the prey of being doing an MRI only to characterize the nature of the lesion. So the take home message is that MRI is a very optimal imaging method and highly sensitive for detection of tumoral tissues for its local staging. It helps in surgical planning, assessing its response to the tumor, especially with the role of new adjuvant chemotherapies, restaging and in follow up. Uh, I would like to again thank the entire uh, team of DOA and Dr. Akshay for having me here. I had a support for Dr. Ruchi, Dr. Amit Sau, and my fellow Dr. Prerna uh, in helping out this presentation. Dr. Neeton, that was uh, a thoroughly enjoyable presentation. I, 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 I'm sure you must have enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, very good yeah. cases uh, demonstrating the real value MR. Uh, I will. I think we have, for want of time, uh, time only for uh, one or two quick questions as to uh, which are really relevant for the purpose of this webinar, which is uh, for the exam going PG. Doctor Sagar, from you, on any quick uh, question? Uh, yeah, not not really. I mean, he has nicely explained. But but uh, what the four things? The first slide which you mentioned. Knowing the stud images, the T1, the T2, and post-contrast fat suppressed images, I think that forms the basics of reading any MRI. And very nicely, you've explained how the cartilage gets in, uh, how the epiphyseal plate can be involved, how to differentiate from the neurovascular bundle, how to know the skip lesions. Many times we get the MRIs with the not the full length bone is taken up. So I think because since it's for the medical students. Uh, they just know the basics of the imaging. Kind of imaging is enough to discuss. So one, two, three, four. What are what are the four things uh, uh, exam going students should know about MRI for tumor? So first of all, I would re-emphasize that they should not try to characterize a tumor just the based on MRI. Uh, they should really, if it so, if the examiner is trying to be uh, judge that whether a student want or to have a look on extra or not, uh, they should ask for it if it has been MRI has been provided to them or it should not be the first investigation to start with. Once they are at a certain level of surety that there is a tumor involvement in the bone or they still uh, the suspicion is pretty high and the X-ray is not contributing, then the role of MRI is definitely there. Uh, it is an excellent tool uh, for the local extent of the tumor, uh, whether the joint or the epiphysis or the physical plate involvement is there. Uh, and what, what length of bone is involved uh, in terms of surgical planning to get a resectionable margin and in a follow-up case. So that's the role of MRI which is there. Uh, this uh, problem what we have is that there is no standardization of acquiring an MR image at uh, most of the centers and most of the hospitals across India. But for as far as bone tumors are concerned, those four sequences are more than enough to characterize and to evaluate the tumor people keep on doing a lot of other stuff in terms of uh, PD images, they tend to do multiple other sequences, but uh, those four would stay as the core to evaluate a tumor. Okay, thank, you. Uh, thank you. I think very nicely put. I think four things that uh, uh, this is a takeaway for exam going students is that it should never be the first uh, investigation of choice when you go for uh, investigating a bone tumor. Yeah. It's the best Quality for uh, local extent of tumor, which uh, includes uh, the marrow extent, the neurovascular bundle involvement, and surgical planning. And of course, the whole bone needs to be imaged, which holds true both for X-rays and the MRI. I think uh, that is all we have time for today. Thank you, Dr. Gyanish, and we'll quickly go on to uh, Venkateshan Sampath Kumar, who is from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Delhi. And uh, uh, he will be presenting a short case as he would want uh, a student of orthopedic examination to uh, do. Uh, Dr. Venkateshan, over to you, sir. You have to unmute yourself, Dr. Venkatesh. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, and we can see your slides. Please go okay. ahead. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Akshay. It's indeed a honor for me to participate as a faculty at DOFPG teaching today. I remember as a postgraduate, I used to attend these teachings, and 
I wish to thank the organizers and the esteemed DOI faculty, especially Dr. Sharad Dagarwal, Dr. Lalit Meni sir, Dr. Hitesh Lal, Dr. Manish Dhawan, our webinar coordinator, Dr. Ravi Chauhan, the author TV team, and our convener today, Dr. Akshay. My special uh, thanks to our senior colleagues, uh, Dr. Sagar sir, Dr. Kundu sir, and of course, uh, Dr. Prajesh. So the way I have structured this uh, today, I'll give you a few slides uh, initially, and then I have a small video. After that, I have got uh, multiple questions which a candidate is expected to answer during the presentation of this particular swelling. Okay, so for want of time, I'll be slightly fast, but uh, if anybody wants, I can share the presentation at the end. You can email me, I will show you my email address. So uh, I would like my postgraduates to just concentrate on the presentation and what do we expect? Yeah. So what do we expect uh, uh, from bone tumors? Bone tumors usually kept as a short case and the candidate is expected to know the clinical examination of a swelling as very well put by uh, Dr. Kuntu sir. So in other words, only tumors which can present as a swelling or deformity will be kept for the exam. So uh, say for example, osteoarthritis, simple bones is hardly you are going to care, have these cases in the exam. So in rare instances, even soft tissue tumors can be kept, uh, especially when they are involving the bone. So be prepared for that also. So what we expect from the candidate is just this. See, both these tumors, on the left side you have a uh, tumor which is very indolent, and on the right side you have a very aggressive tumor. Both are cartilage tumors. But what we expect from the candidate is to differentiate these two kinds of tumors in the exam. So basically one is a benign, whereas other is a malignant. One is within the compartment, other is extending beyond the compartment. One is slow growing, other is rapidly growing. One is swelling followed by pain. Mostly, uh, chondrosarcomas can present as swelling followed by pain, but sometimes osteos present as pain followed by swelling, and one does not metastasize. And this is what it's very important, because if you are identifying a, a malignant tumor, rather than barging in on treatment and curating it, it's indeed important to establish the bio, uh, diagnosis by biopsy. So. All we expect from a candidate is whether he is a safe person to practice independently so that he does not cause any harm to the patient by curating a malignant tumor. That's what we want from a postgraduate student. So all these things have been nicely covered by Dr. Kuntu, sir. So what I want to add is uh, pain usually during night and relief by NSAIDs. It's very typical of an austere osteoma. And the trauma history is mostly incidental trauma because that's something which examiner would like to ask. But it is very important to elicit this history because one of the differential diagnoses for bone tumors, uh, especially very hard tumors, is myositis ossificans. And if you had elicited this history, you can keep this as a differential diagnosis. And one thing you must understand, the same tumor can have different presentations. So don't expect all tumors to have only a swelling. See, this is an osteochondroma which is presented as a swelling. But the same osteochondroma can present with a deformity, same osteochondroma can have a limblen discrepancy, and the same osteochondroma can present with pain due to bursitis. So there are so many different ways by which a same tumor can present. So it's important to have an open mind to, and to look for all these things during your case presentation in your exam. So to my uh, case today, it's a 30-year-old male presenting with swelling in the left leg for 18 months. Um, insidious and onset, slowly progressive and associated with pain very lately, uh, he is able to carry out most of his day-to-day -day activities. So, uh, rather than wasting time on history, I'll just show a quick video on how I would examine this swelling today. Yeah. Dr. Venkat, is there an audio as well as in, in this video? Yes, yes. Are you not able to hear the audio? We are not able to hear the audio. I'm not sure. I am able to hear it. I do not know why. Okay, anyways, I think you can go on describing in case. Uh, actually, okay. audio sound must be less actually, that's why. Okay. 
Maybe you can so. increase the audio. Uh, I have increased my audio to the maximum. Sir, your recording must have must be having low audio at that time of recording, maybe. Um, can you just try once? If not, we will uh, leave the video. Can you hear anything? No. Yes, not anything, huh? No, nothing. So what you can just speak over the audio, sir. You can speak over the video. Uh, okay. This, so I would speak over the video. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so just just a second. The patient is uh, lying comfortably supine with a in extension, knee in extension, ankle in neutral position. The most obvious swelling is present over the proximal two thirds of the leg, and it, it, there is presence of dilated veins, and there are three puckered scars present over the anterior aspect of the patella. There is a skin excoriation noted over the medial aspect of the leg, over the proximal aspect. There are no obvious any sinuses or pulsations visible from the anterior aspect. On examination from the lateral aspect, the knee is kept in extension. Uh, there is a uh, globular swelling noted in the proximal two thirds of the leg. There is a biopsy scar noted on the junction of proximal third and the middle third of the leg, probably due to a coronal biopsy. On inspection from the back, there is no obvious wasting of the hamstrings. However, there is a skin excoriation noted in the middle of the popliteal area on the uh, lateral aspect of the leg. The, Swelling is diffuse and globular. There are no visible pulsations and there are no dilated veins. On examination, from the posterior so before palpating, the, uh, please wash your hands with soap and water or clean with sterilium. It's very important. Some examiners are very, very uh, finicky about it. And the first thing you need to look for is the temperature. Uh, you need to use the back of your hand and examine the normal side first and compare it with the uh, affected side. That in this case, the temperature is mildly raised. Now I am concentrating on the face of the patient and looking for tenderness. Uh, the patient is having uh, tenderness on deep palpation. Now I am looking for skin fixity. As you can see, the skin is not fixed uh, and the skin is pinchable. The swelling is globular in shape, approximately 14 into 10 centimeter in size, and it is continuous with the fibula. On palpating the tibia, I am able to feel an indentation between the swelling and the anterior aspect of the shin of the tibia. The swelling is distinctly away from the tibia. The surface of the swelling is smooth. The consistency is variable and firm to hard, and the swelling extends deep into the popliteal area. I am now looking for pulsations on the popliteal area and to look for any other swellings noted in the popliteal area. The popliteal pulsation is palpable above the swelling and it is comparable to the opposite side. I am measuring the swelling with inch shape. For uh, examination purposes, I have marked the uh, margins of the swelling, but in this case, the margins are very, very imperceptible. The swelling is approximately 14 centimeter in length and 14 centimeter in breadth. I am looking for tenderness in the knee joint. There is no joint line tenderness. I am looking at the patient's uh, face now. Whenever you look for tenderness, it's very important you need to look at the patient's face. I am also looking for tenderness in the patellofemoral joint. There is no fixed flexion deformity in any of the knees. 
on the right knee the patient is having an active knee range of motion from 0 to 150 degree and it is not associated with any spasm or crepitus on the left knee the active range of motion is from 0 to 120 degree there is a 30 degree flexion uh, restriction and it is mechanically restricted further passive flexion is not possible and there is no spasm or crepitus during the entire range of motion now we'll go for longitudinal measurements i have marked the medial joint line of the knee and i have marked the medial end of the uh, a tip of the medial pedalus since the area of interest is the leg i would like to concentrate only on true measurements of the leg keep both the limbs in identical position so the length on the right side is 38 cm compared to the same measurement on the left side so there is no true limb length discrepancy on this patient the circumferential measurement is better done in the thigh in this case as the swelling is uh, diffuse and extending into the middle third of the leg measuring the circumference in the leg would sometimes be erroneous to look for any wasting so what i've done i marked as a point around 15 cm proximal to the medial joint line on both the legs on circumferential measurement the measurement is 39 cm on the left side compared to 41 cm on the right side so there is a 2 cm wasting of the thigh compartment compared to the normal side now we'll go for the distal neurovascular examination so for the neurovascular examination we need to look for sensory examination motor examination as well as the vascular status the sensory examination since we are doing uh, looking for at a swelling in the proximal aspect of the leg we need to examine for distal sensors over the greater saphenous nerve superficial peroneal nerve deep peroneal nerve as well as the sural nerve and we need to compare it with the so i am asking the patient that i am touching the patient on both the sides whether he is able to feel it equally on both the sides or not i'm looking for the deep peroneal sensation now i'm looking for the sural nerve area now so the sensations are bilateral and equal for motor examination i would like to look for function of the common peroneal nerve better elicited by measuring the motor power of tibialis anterior so for tibialis anterior it's a dorsiflexion uh, so we like to test for active dorsiflexion against resistance and we need to put resistance over the uh, distal aspect of the first metatarsal and i am comparing bilateral uh, power simultaneously so the power is slightly weak on the left side compared to the right side it's 4 by 5 on left compared to 5 by 5 on the right side i am looking for pulsations i am looking for dorsalis pedis pulsation just lateral to the extensor handlosis longus tendon over the navicular and the cuneiforms before it dips into the first web space and the dorsalis pedis pulsation is equal in this case i need to, and now i am looking for pulsations over the posterior tibial artery just behind the medial pallidus pulsations are equal now i am looking for lymphadenopathy both in the popliteal area as well as in the inguinal nerve there are no obvious lymph nodes palpable bilateral no so for the exam you need to remember this uh, uh, this is kept Please, everyone mute case. yourself except dr sampath everyone mute yourself yeah for the exam uh, this is usually kept as a short case so the classic four questions of a short case need to be remembered by each candidate what is your diagnosis why do you say so what else can it be and how will you manage this patient when you tell the diagnosis say whether it is clinically benign or aggressive that which in turn means malignant please don't forget the sites many of the times candidates forget the sites name the bone and the part of the bone name the diagnosis 
or the differential diagnosis and mention complications if there are any. And why do you say so? You need to talk about the relevant points, which I will elaborate in a bit. And what else can it be? You need to tell the differential diagnosis and how will you manage this patient. Always start with investigations before jumping to the treatment. Give non-invasive investigations before uh, talking about the invasive investigations. How to clinically differentiate benign and malignant core tumors? This has been covered extensively. All I want to give you is a mnemonic. Differentiation is not based upon a single history or examination findings. Look for five points in history, three points in general examination, five points in inspection, five points in palpation, and throw other points. Five, three, five, five, two. That's what I usually do. What are the five points in history? Onset, swelling followed by pain, more in favor of benign. Pain followed by swelling, more in favor of malignant. Duration, months to years, as against weeks to months. Activity, loss of function is more in favor of a malignant swelling. Symptoms suggestive of metastasis like pleurisy, cough, uh, breathlessness, or swellings at other parts of the body. History of chemotherapy. This is the only history which is very pathognomonic of a malignant swelling. If a patient gives history of chemotherapy, it is for sure a malignant swelling. General examination, look for findings of cachexia, look for findings of metastasis, look for swelling in multiple sites of the body, especially look for deformed forearms in case of, in case of a hereditary multiple exostosis. Inspective findings, stretched and shiny skin, dilated veins, irregular surface, wasting of limb, ulceration or fungation. Remember, in this case, we had a smooth surface, we had dilated veins and wasting of limb, but the skin was normal, it was not stretched or shiny, and there were no ulcerations or fungations. Local examination, temperature raised, significant tenderness, ill-defined margins, variable consistency, and fixity. These findings are in favor of malignant swelling. And two other points, restricted joint mobility if there is a joint involvement, and disturbed neurovascular deficit or proximal lymphadenopathy. So, if you have, if you kind of make a whole chart of all these things, then you will know what are the points in favor of benign swelling in this case and what are the points against malignant uh, uh, benign swelling in this case. Okay, So how to clinically differentiate a soft tissue malignancy involving the bone from a morning malignancy with associated soft tissue complaint? This is often asked in the exam. In both the conditions, the swelling will be immobile and attached to the underlying bone. However, a primary bony malignancy will be continuous with the bone when palpating along the edges of the swelling. Like uh, in this case, the swelling was continuous with the fibula, whereas a primary soft tissue malignancy, sometimes you will be able to feel an indentation. Okay. The next thing is, uh, primary soft tissue swelling will be present only in one compartment when it is attached to the bone, whereas bone swelling with a soft tissue component, for example, in this case, distal femur, it can have soft tissue component both in the extensor compartment as well as in the flexor compartment. This is another important thing when you look at the X-ray uh, to differentiate between a primary soft tissue tumor is a primary bone tumor. You need to look for four things. You need to mark the epicenter of the lesion. If it lies outside, it's more in favor of a soft tissue tumor. The cortex is beveled from outside to inside, more in favor of a soft tissue tumor. Whereas in bone tumor with a, cord, a soft tissue component, the cortex is beveled from inside to outside. The periosteal direction will be absent in a soft tissue tumor and the size of the lesion will be smaller in the bone and larger in the soft tissue for a primary soft tissue tumor. I hope all of you get this. So our case, this was the radiograph. I'm sure Dr. Akshay's lecture would have helped you very much in reading the x-rays. But here we have a plain radiograph, AP and lateral view of a skeletally mature patient showing uh, of the left leg, showing pathology involving the uh, left proximal leg and the left proximal fibula. There is an uh, epiphyseal metaphyseal uh, lytic lesion with uh, ballooning of cortex and multiple internal septations located in the proximal third of the fibula. There is a lesion loaded in the tibia as well, in the, pro in the lateral condyle with a similar internal septations and uh, geographic uh, margins and narrow zone of transition. There are no matrix mineralization. There is no uh, uh, 
extensive soft tissue component here apart from the ballooning of the cortex. So clinically, I would uh, clinical radiologically, I would like to term it as a Janssen tumor. So uh, the for one thing which uh, every candidate would be expected to know is how would you grade the Janssen tumor? We all should be uh, uh, familiar with the Campanocchi grading. Grade one is a well-defined margin. There is a rim of mature bone present all around and the cortex is either intact or slightly thin, but it is never deformed. Whereas in grade two, there is no, no radiopaque rim. The cortex is thinned and moderately expanded, but it is not eroded. Whereas in grade three, the tumor bulges into the soft tissues and there is low limitation by the shell of reactive bone. So this Campanaki grading is often asked in the exam. And how would you stage the lesion? Staging and grading are different. Staging is given by Enneking and stage, staging of a, a benign a tumor is done as either latent, active or aggressive. So by the time the candidate has this uh, uh, lesion, uh, which is uh, kept for the exam, it's usually in the aggressive phase because it has already perforated the cortex or the soft tissue mass or the cortex is at least expanded. So for your exam, you will have either an active lesion or an aggressive lesion. Very rare for you to have a latent GCT or a latent benign lesion for the exam. So what the one frequent question asked is, what is a Jane cell tumor? It is a neoplasm of mesenchymal stromal cells that have the ability to recruit and harbor macrophages and osteoclast type Jane uh, cells. Please remember the term Jane cell tumor is a misnomer. It is not a tumor of Jane cells. The Jane cells are reactive cells, but still Blackwood, when he coined the term, he thought it's a Jane cell tumor. So if a tumor has Jane cells, can you call it GCT? No. Any kind of bone tumor in the bone can have reactive Jane cells. So for a tumor to be called as a Jane cell tumor, it should have a combination of round to oval mononuclear stromal cells, which are the neoplastic cells, and more or less uniformly distributed Jane cells. And more importantly, the nuclei of Jane cells and GCT should be very similar to those of the mononuclear stromal cells. This particular finding is very important to differentiate it from Jane cell variants. Atypical mitosis are usually not seen. If it is present, it is indicative of a Jane cell rich sarcoma usually. So what is the need of MRI? Beautifully covered in the previous lecture. I need to nurse it. One thing I would like to tell the candidates is, it happens in our exams also. When asked you, why do you do MRI? Candidate first cell. I want to see, look for joint involvement. The next question is, how many times do you think a GCT will involve the joint? See, GCT is a benign aggressive tumor. Although it is epiphyseal, joint involvement usually happens only if there is a pathological fracture. So rather than jumping and saying joint involvement, please say common things first. I need to uh, do a local staging, look for the size, delineate the size of the tumor, vascularity and neurovascular involvement. These are more important than joint, in joint involvement. How will you treat the lesion? So please remember, don't jump and give you uh, give an ideal treatment. Of course, it depends upon multiple factors. When, I, when the examiner asks you, how will you treat this tumor? All he wants to know is whether you know the principles of management. So the treatment for a Jane cell tumor can be either an extended curatage or an excision. So a curatage oncologically might be inadequate, but it has good functional outcomes. Whereas excision oncologically will be very adequate, but it has significant disability because the tumors are located epiphyseally and majority of the times so you need to sacrifice the arms. So extended curatage is in fact a bargain between curatage and excision. How will you perform the curatage is again asked. Many of the times uh, what the examiner expects from you is he expects to know whether you have seen this procedure being done by your seniors. So, you need to know how to make a cortical window. The window should be the size of the lesion. It should be elliptical in shape along the long axis of the bone. It should include the already destroyed bone. And the window should be ideally in a place where the cortex is destroyed and there is a soft tissue mass. And you need to remove the uh, tumor with a high speed burr. Use of high speed burr is very, very mandatory. Examiner will expect you to know that because nowadays high speed burr is an integral part of an extended curatage. Use a pulsatile lava system if it's available and the recurrence rate is usually 15 to 60%. How can you, can you discuss regarding adjuvants? It's a big topic. I will quickly run through it. Please, first of all, try to classify. If somebody asks you what are the adjuvants, classify. 
I need to classify the adjuvants as mechanical, physical, chemical. So chemical adjuvants, phenol, very commonly used. We used it very routinely. The percentages might vary depending upon the preference of the uh, surgeon, but we must be able to know the advantages and the disadvantages. It causes terminal necrosis, the disadvantage. It can cause skin burn if you do not use it properly. If you kind of spill it over the soft tissues, it can have significant systemic absorption. And the time required is usually five to six minutes. Liquid nitrogen, it is, it, 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 uh, you need to know there are at least three free store cycles required for the liquid nitrogen to act adequately. And it can, the margin can be extended up to two centimeters. The disadvantages sometimes can cause pathological fractures and degenerative changes, especially uh, the cartilage might be damaged. These two are important uh, disadvantages of liquid nitrogen. Organ beam cauterization, very good if, it, if you have it. But again, the problem with organ beam, uh, it is very good to reduce the recurrence, especially when used with a, a bone cement. However, uh, sometimes it is not e easily available. Uh, most of the organ beams can be added to regular cautery machines in high-end cautery machines. The next question which is asked is, how will you reconstruct the defect after extended curettage? You can, re for smaller defects, usually you don't get such lesions for your exam, but very small defects can be left for the cavity to heal by itself. However, for larger defects, you need to use either autograft, allograft, bone substitutes or bone cement. I would quickly give you the advantages of bone cement alone. The methyl metacrylate is cytotoxic. You need to uh, tell that when you say, I would prefer cementing, the thermal effect might help to extend the margins, although it's not always documented. Most important advantage of the cement is radiographic, radiographic detection of recurrence is easier on follow-up compared to a boot graft. That is, and it's cheap. There is no donor site morbidity. There is no risk of disease transmission. However, cement is not a biological material. It is relatively weak when subjected to shear and torsional force. Remember, cement is strong in compression, weak in tension. So, supposing if you are using it for a neck of femur, there is sometimes that you will have a fracture through the uh, cement due to the shear forces acting through the neck of femur. Bone graft, of course, uh, the advantage is it under, it's biological, but the disadvantage is donor site morbidity. And the, uh, I do not want to discuss in detail today. So what will be a follow-up protocol? Uh, very well described by Dr. Uh, Kuntu sir. Three months in the first uh, uh, year or first two years. After that, six monthly, uh, even up to five years. And what will you look for in the radiographs? I look for evidence of local recurrence. So local recurrence is always related to surgical margins. It is clinically characterized by pain and radiologically by progressive lysis. And soft tissue recurrence can be visible on radiographs with the help of, uh, as peripheral calcifications. Most important thing, the local recurrence in GCT can be treated like a primary tumor, unlike a local, local recurrence in an osteosarcoma or heaving sarcoma, where a local recurrence has to undergo an amputation or a curative margin. So, what is the role of formula colloquial agents? Very debatable, but it will be definitely asked in the exam, especially denosumab. How does it work? It will be asked monoclonal antibody against anclegon. And of late, there has been recent concerns of using denosumab in extended curettage because people think since denosumab is an antibody, it is tumor static and there is possibility of recurrence from the tumor shell, which is left behind. Whereas bisphosphonates, it is tumor sedal and uh, there are some centers like Dr. Kuntu Sir and our own center where we prefer bisphosphonates because it is very cheap and it is uh, very active, especially in converting a lesion from uh, 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 a lesion for ex excision to a lesion for cure touch. Like in this case, a uh, patient who has developed, uh, who has received bisphosphonate has got very good function. Can a GCT metastasize? This is often asked. Metastasis incidence is very rare, roughly 1 to 6 percent. Histologically, it is identical to the primary lesion, and the most common site is lungs. Okay. Metastatic lesions should be resected if possible. When they cannot be resected, you can try chemotherapy or even radiotherapy. Steroids are often useful. So, this is very important. 
a tumor which is locally aggressive, which can fungate, but which can also metastasize. Why is GCT still considered benign and not malignant? Many times examiner would like to ask this question if you are doing very well in your exam. So the answer is this. Metastatic disease in GCT does not carry the same poor prognosis as metastasis in malignant tumors such as osteosarcoma and even sarcoma. Both non-metastatic and metastatic tumors look similar on histology and considering a GCT as malignant will result in all patients undergoing wide excision which, is which will lead to unacceptable morbidity because majority of these tumors are epiphysic. So that's the reason why GCT is still considered benign because majority of the patients are able to get away with extended cure touch. So is there an entity called malignant GCT? Yes, there is an entity called malignant GCT. Primary malignant GCT is extremely rare. It is a combination of GCT-like areas with high-grade sarcomas. So sometimes it's a DNCL rich osteosarcoma, which is uh, wrongly termed as a malignant GCT. But previous years, about two decades ago, uh, radiotherapy used to be a common method of treatment for GCT. And majority of these irradiated GCTs can have secondary sarcomatous transformation, also called secondary malignant GCTs. They are usually are high-grade osteosarcomas or fibrosarcomas, and they have a very poor prognosis. Majority of them land up in amputation. So finally, this is my final slide. So this is the treatment algorithm for GCT. It, like in our case, it's a proximal fibula, which is an exact, uh, which is expendable bone. We can only go ahead with excision. If you, it's not an exact expendable bone. If you have adequate article bone after intrajudicial curettage, you can go for extended curettage with or without bone grafting or bone cementing. Of course, if the cortical integrity cannot be maintained with extended curettage, then we need to go for excision. The excise, the defect can be reconstructed with either prosthesis or arthrodesis or using a bone graft, vascularized fibula graft. So I would, I would like to use this opportunity to tell you guys that we have an oncology fellowship program going on at the Ames and uh, there are other fellowship program going on as well, uh, which is twice a year entry. And if you are interested, you are welcome to join our unit. And um, I would like to thank my teachers, Professor Shishi Rastaki, Professor Shah Alam, and this is my entire team. Thank you once again. This is my email address, venkatauthofor at gmail.com. If at all you have any queries, you can even email me. And if you want this presentation PDF, I can email you. I'm, stop, I'm stopping my screen share now. Thank you, Dr. Venkatesh. That was a really nice uh, elaboration as to how a GCT case should be presented in exam. Uh, very nicely put. We have time for a few questions, if Dr. Manish allows. Thank you, Dr. Akshay. I'm sorry, I had to be a bit fast today because of uh, time constraint, but I hope uh, the listeners enjoyed the discussion. Yeah, Dr. Hamesh will always have a question, I know. Uh, Dr. Akshay, as far as your experience goes, although Dr. Sampada has elaborated on that point, but I would like to know your views. Denosumab, I personally feel, is more popular nowadays among uh, ortho-oncologists or ortho-oncosurgeons versus bisposonate. What is your take on that? Well, uh, as Dr. Venkat said, there are some uh, concerns uh, with the denosumab actually increasing recurrence rates when you go for curettage after denosumab. So we might uh, uh, put denosumab into three indications. One is uh, uh, when you want to convert a resectable GCT into a curatable GCT, uh, where it is a pre-op uh, indication. The other is when you want to convert an unresectable into a resectable GCT. And the third is when you want to use denosumab as a definitive treatment. We have been using denosumab in all three indications. When you want to, uh, to convert an uncuratable into a curatable GCT, you create a bony shell and then you use that shell against which you can curate. Uh, and there have been concerns that uh, the actual recurrence rates might be higher than you curate after denosumab because you don't know where uh, which one is actually normal bone and which one is just the giant cell tumor bone ossified because of, G because of denosumab. 
but we have been using my own experience i use only for the two latter conditions that is for uh, enabling or uh, uh, facilitating a re resection in a giant cell tumor because it loses all its vascularity becomes very well uh, delineated good cortex and becomes much easier to resect marginal excision is all you need and the other is definitive use where you use long term denosumab for unresectable gcts or gcts which are uh, metastatic or multicentric as against uh, zoledronic acid as dr venkat said some concerns regarding whether which one is static or which one is sidal for giant cell tumors or rather the spindle cells which are the actual neoplastic lesions uh concerns are that denosumab uh, kills only the giant cell tumors or uh, stops only them but does nothing to the actual uh, neoplastic tumors which are the spindle cells or the mononuclear cells uh that is where uh, zoledronic acid scores a bit over denosumab they are both being used uh, by different institutes aims i know uses uh, zoledronic zoledronic acid much more i am using denosumab much more than zoledronic acid what about the atypical fracture risk with the zoledronic acid which we see once in year use then also we see it so frequently after 3 to 4 years here we are using it much higher dose much more frequently i don't think we have seen these atypical fractures any more than usual in uh, probably because these are young patients i don't uh, we have not seen and then because you uh, you uh, give it only for a certain duration you don't give them indefinitely can i answer dr akshay yeah doctor. yeah yeah so the dosage we are uh, what we are do using is the dosage which is being used in uh, cases like myelomas so for the osteoporosis we have 5 mg once yearly for uh, gct we use 4 mg once monthly for three doses and this dosing regimen has been used for many many years in myelomas and hematological malignancies to prevent pathological fractures and in our experience we have been using it since 2010 under professor rastogi sir and um, uh, in our experience we have not had any atypical fractures but there is a concern see around 70% of giant cell tumors appear to respond to zoledronic acid but around 25 to 30% of tumors do not show any kind of response and till now uh, we have not had any particular feature by which we can differentiate this 70 and 30 so but whereas in denosumab more than 95% of the patients have good response to denosumab but in some cases for example uh, due to our waiting list sometimes patient takes zoledronic acid they have good response and uh, due to waiting list they disappear from our system and we have had cases who come back to us even after 8 years and the lesion had remained static after zoledronic acid and of course uh, it's not a big series so we cannot make a conclusion based upon one or two uh, cases but what i want to emphasize is uh, till now for post graduates both these drugs are not the standard treatment care so the post graduates must be very clear in this uh you are not going to say i am going to put this patient on denosumab i am going to put this patient on zoledronic acid both are still under research and investigation purposes and uh selected indications are there for use of these drugs but it is important the mechanism of action and the advantages and disadvantages should be known to the post graduates thank you yeah nicely put uh, venkatesh um and i want to add here that uh, even for uh, metastatic lesions the uh, you know patients uh, have keep on having zoledronic acid every month for uh, even one year or two years and even there we do not see any issues uh, as such so uh, it has been used quite often uh any uh, i will ask my esteemed panelists so, uh, to add any concluding uh, concluding remarks before we and today's webinar i i think we've enjoyed i've enjoyed the webinar nicely there's no comments left i think it's been a long webinar for so i think all the speakers have nicely put the things and the students have to pick up the points regarding diagnosis clinical examination x-ray workup mri workup and the last presentation by dr vegetesh is actually 
very nicely put up how to do the clinical examination i think it's been nicely put up great effort so yeah dr bajesh uh, it was a very nice presentation by dr venkate yes i think uh, uh, being in ems he, he is a uh, most experienced among us as a examiner and he presented it very well thank you sir well i uh, i must add here that i have also enjoyed this has been a two series uh, webinar uh, one last sunday and one this time and i think delhi orthopedic association is leading the way as uh, as far as pg teaching is concerned and it's not just about orthopedic oncology other uh, areas also have been covered in these pg teaching webinars and <coughs> congratulations to dr sharad dr manish uh, uh, dr harmesh and everyone involved dr lalit many yeah thank you dr akshay the dr manish uh, over to you yeah any any other questions or we wrap it up and uh, dr hitesh is not there so i will request dr uh, sharad to do his closing remarks dr sharad and dr then dr lalit man dr sharad uh, uh, well Uh, in the postgraduate teaching program of Delhi Orthopedic Association, today we had part two of musculoskeletal oncology short, short case series webinar. The subject has been dealt as a uh, short case series considering the requirement of postgraduate examinations. On behalf of DOA, my sincere thanks to the learned faculty of senior teachers comprising of Professor <laughs> Dr. Akshay Tiwari, Dr. Ganesh Agarwal, and Dr. V. Sampath Kumar for their lucid presentations, which I am sure have given. the post graduates have very clear insight into the presentation of a case of a bone tumor and what all are they expected to know about it during the examination thanks to our expert panel of dr r r sagar and dr prajesh nandan for their well valuable inputs in the discussion my thanks again to dr akshay tiwari the convener of this webinar dr manish dhawan who moderated it and the whole doa faculty for sparing their time for the webinar special thanks to dr ravi chohan for his untiring efforts in organizing the webinar Thanks to Dr. Shamshul Huda, Dr. Gulani, and Dr. Shok Shyam for all the technical support. And finally, my thanks again to the sponsors of this program, Jadis Kedila, for their unrestricted dedication. Thank you. Uh, Professor Mani, please. I think a uh, very nice uh, part two of orthopedic oncology. I would just like to re-emphasize to the students that there are two parts. One part is the systematic assessment of a uh, uh, bony swelling. and the second part is an approach to the bone tumor both have equal importance so if you do your first part well you will go ahead with your second part uh, properly so so re emphasizing that you need to practice examination of the swelling and try to remember all the points which are required in the exam thank you thank you everyone and uh, we really enjoyed this webinar Okay, thank you. Good night. Thank you. Uh, Mani sir, can I stop live streaming? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, you can stop. Thank you, Akshay. <coughs> uh, now we are offline, sir. Thank you, Doctor Sanjay. Yeah, okay, thank now you. I think. I'm sorry, if my audio didn't work, Doctor Akshay. No, no, but it worked very well. Thank you. Did it very well, Doctor Sampath. So, yeah. Doctor Sharad, we are preparing uh, next for the spine webinar. Mani sir, Mani sir. Ah, uh, you can show that uh, spine. Can I share? Thing. Can I share yeah. the spine? Yeah, yeah. Part. So this is the next Sunday's uh, uh, flyer we have made. Yes, we have received it, Doctor. Yeah, you can just correct it so that we can tomorrow work over it. Scientific sign program is bit long. We have to manage the time. Yes. How many? How many speakers? Sir, eight speakers total. Four hours. <laughs> Maybe more than that. <laughs> I already, already conveyed to Hitesh, Doctor Hitesh, and Doctor Kamran to see it. So I mean, promise that it is only eight, ten uh, minutes, ten to twelve minutes in each. Uh, uh, maximum, sir, not more yeah. than that. Let's see. Uh, can I stop sharing? So online dinner, be I think, will have to be done next time. No, you start it now. That delivery has started. Look, people have attended ten webinars. उनको होम डिलीवरी शुरू कराई ओके ओके चलो गुड नाइट गुड नाइट एवरीवन थैंक यू वेरी मच आई एम एंडिंग दिस सर थैंक यू सर बाय बाय थैंक यू थैंक यू डॉक्टर संपत गुड नाइट थैंक यू सर